you still hear me, Jay? Yeah, you sound good to me. Perfect. Okay. Nice to click on. It's always good for me to have headphones on because if if you're talking right in my ear, I can just listen to all the content of what you're saying better. It's just right there. Yeah, I, I probably should do that eventually because I always end up having these issues, but I also don't like the idea of wearing headphones yeah, throughout every interview that I do, but um, I'm just making sure that we sound good. Okay. Yeah, I, I probably... Okay, so I need to make sure that your volume is up a little louder. I, got, I can turn up the gain. Yeah, you you're a little low, so. Um, what about now? Just one second. Let me. I'll make sure you're fixed. Perfect. All right, test test. Uh, you guys ready? Pedro, can you give me a mic check? Mic check one two one two three four five. Does everybody hear Mike uh, uh, hear Pedro good? Volume up. So I've got him up all the way. Let me try that. Gotcha. Okay, now, now sit closer and closer to the mic until you got me. How about all that? right? Let's yeah, give me another mic check, Pedro, and let's see if that's good. Testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five. Give it a second to catch up and we'll see. Is that, is that better, you guys? Better? Is it good enough or do we need do we jack them up more? Sounds good, pretty good. Turn your gain up, Pedro. Can you do that? Somebody said. Chase. Chase yeah. isn't Chase is an audio guy. Hello. Oh, Hello. Perfect. Much better. Nice. Okay. Cool beans. Mic check. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Cool beans, dude. All right. All right, everybody. So uh, this is impromptu debate. Uh, we didn't plan this, and um, we got to talk in the day after the debate that Tristan had with Destiny that we wanted to set up um, another debate, and then pedro was kind enough to agree of course pedro is over at the crucible which is a new debate channel which i'm sure everybody kind of probably saw the uh tristan destiny debate and the crucible was kind enough to have me on uh about a week or two ago and we had a good good chat over there so uh i've been looking for a protestant to come on and present the protestant it's actually been about three years since we had a protestant come on to debate so Really? Uh, pro yeah, props to Pedro for coming on. Um, I didn't have a chance to put your brief bio in the description, but I'll add that later. So if you want to give everybody uh, an introduction to you, and then I'm not trying to yeah, to uh, to mess with anything. It's just, uh, so I've been talking for like five hours already today. So my, my mind is a little mush, but I'm still, we're still going to power through this. For sure, for sure. No, so uh, before we get started, and we're going to do a formal debate, everybody's going to be timed. We're going to do uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, setup that Pedro suggested. Um, I'm going to let him give his brief introduction uh, and tell you guys whatever he wants to tell you guys about himself, and then we will kick it off. And let's see, how do we? Uh, you we have it as opening, minutes, yeah, opening fifteen, CNC. ten cross-examination and then yep. back to cross-examination and then closing statements so tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're at what your faith is and then we'll we'll kick it off well pretty much uh, my name is Pedro I'm a reformed theologian uh, pretty much the core of what we believe is that there is a sovereign God who is demonstrating his grace and mercy through the salvation of or he's also glorifying himself through the salvation of a particular people through the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm a young theologian. I'm very much uh, just jumping in, getting my feet wet. So I very much am honored to actually be up against someone of Jay Stackstra. I've seen a lot of his debates. 
and I, I'm, I'm glad he's allowing himself to be, you know, put up to scrutiny against, you know, kind of a dark horse because let's face it, the it, it's like martial arts. If you get to watch somebody else fighting for a while and then they don't know anything about you and then you just come out of the gate, that person who's been able to watch pretty much has the advantage. So that's who I am. Uh, really, I would very much just like to have a nice discussion. It's going to get knives out, let's be honest. Knives are going to come out at some point. But at the same time, I want to demonstrate how Christian theologians are actually supposed to you know, carry themselves in the heat of debate. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and <clears throat> this is not to put you on the spot, but uh, do you have a, a confessional church that you attend, or is it like just classically Protestant or evangelical? Or do uh, we... I'm a I'm a Southern Baptist. Okay. If we want to say. Okay. And uh, obviously Calvin Calvinist. I've let I've read most of Calvin work now at this point, but I have not done the uh, extensive study notes like I do with some of my most books. I have like. I actually took it from Jay to put sticky notes in all my books and write everything <laughs> up. It's just the way to go. Because when you read a book, I think you can't just speed and demon like go light speed through it. That's not how you learn. You gotta take your time with these things. I feel like. So, so let's see. Um, can you get turn that gain back up? Because people are saying it's still too quiet. Gotcha, gotcha. How about now? Yeah, better. Perfect. Okay. All right, so um, since the topic for the night is Sola Scriptura, uh, we're going to give Pedro, he's going to have the opening statement in the affirmative that Sola Scriptura is true and should be believed. And I'm going to set the timer um, and uh, what did we say, 15 minutes opening? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, let me know when you're ready and I'll hit the timer. Gotcha. All right. So Andrew said, it? Andrew said, get closer to the mic if you can. It's a little soft. Gotcha. Can you see this? Yeah. Perfect. And let the chat, let the chat know, see if they can hear it too. Does this sound All good, guys? things that are read from the Holy Scriptures in order to our instruction and salvation, it behooves us to hear with earnest heed. If those believed afterwards who had killed, should not those believe who for a little while doubted? And yet, even in regard of them, a thing which ye ought especially to observe and to commit to your memory, because that which shall make us strong against insidious errors, God has been pleased to put in the scriptures, against which no man dares to speak, who in any sort wishes to seem a Christian. When he had given himself to be handled by them, that did not suffice him, but he would also confirm by means of the scriptures, the heart of them that believe. For he looked forward to us who should be afterwards, seeing that in him we have nothing we can handle, but have that which we may read. Whenever there has been turmoil in the church, an unfortunate presence of presuppositions and assumptions that often go unchallenged have led from minuscule to catastrophic actions such as church splits, even violent persecutions on both sides of the aisle. That fact does not apply anywhere else more than I think when it comes to the issue of Sola Scriptura. To outline my intentions here more clearly in this opening statement, I will be covering two basic objectives, which are one, defining what Sola Scriptura is, and two, give a response to the common objections usually alleged toward the rule of faith. This is so we can move the conversation away from defending concepts and ideas that are contradictory to the actual position we hold and to move forward to our most important goal and actual design of the rule of, rule of faith, which is asking the real questions. What tradition do you want to impose on us that we cannot be found in scripture? By what standard does the creators of the tradition claim their authority? Is this practice, law, rule, doctrine, or dogma contradictory to scripture in any way? Let's begin by defining what the doctrine of faith is. Because the scriptures are the only example of God-breathed revelation in the possession of the church, they therefore form the only infallible standard 
by which every other rule of authority of the church should be tested. We come to this conclusion from the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 and the account of Matthew 22.31, perfectly defining Scripture as God-breathed and that which equips us for every good work. God's voice admits no higher or equal authority in effect to Scripture being in fact the ultimate authority subjugating any other. To practice sola scriptura in its purest essence is to use scripture as the lens through which you identify traditions, rules, laws, and authorities established by man and to discern whether that rule, tradition, law, or authority should be tossed to the fire or affirmed simply based off the question, does this practice authority oppose God's word? To make sure we are nailing this to the church door properly, let's take a second to define what sola scriptura is not. It is not a denial of God's word at specific times being in oral form during those times of inscription. It is not a denial of Holy Scripture leading and guiding the church. It is surely not the assertion that the Bible contains all exhaustive knowledge. It is not the assertion that we learn nothing from the previous generations. It is not a denial of authority or an assertion of the destruction of the church government. It is not you, your Bible, under a tree. Now that you have an understanding of what the rule of faith is and what it is not, please remember to pay attention and train your ears to quickly identify the difference between these two statements throughout this debate. Let us now move into responding to the common objections levied at the feet of the rule of faith, starting with when our opponents say we are identifying slash redefining a different meaning of the word from their understanding. Simply direct them hastily to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith or uh, the 1641 Westminster Confession of Faith version. As seen here, that'll show them the only ones redefining our rule of faith concerning this matter is in fact them. The next most common and probably crucial argument we knock down is you're placing your faith in a fallible listing of infallible books. Or how do you know Matthew wrote Matthew without the church? The knee-jerk reaction should be to immediately switch your mind to defending scripture itself, not sola scriptura. You are now against someone who has placed their own wisdom above that of Scripture. Move forward to establish these three premises. The Bible is a reliable artifact that gives us a fair record of history and whose historical pedigree in terms of written documents of antiquity is unmatched. It, it, it describes Jesus Christ, who at the very least, we don't believe this, but who at the very least is a prophet of God. He, Jesus, claimed that all he taught was from the Father and that he was the truth incarnate. This will fall upon the question naturally, did Jesus ever sin? And make no mistake, only the non-believers answers yes. After that, you should get the obvious no. You can then point to the obvious outcome as follows. Jesus is in fact God, the light, the word, the flesh, the truth, the only way. His view of Scripture should therefore in fact be the church's view of Scripture. And the Bible is not just an artifact of history, but that of revelation, God's revealed will to man on earth, and as Jesus taught, should be considered the very breath of God. On these grounds, this basis is where we identify that ontologically in the hierarchy of authority which dictates doctrine, teaching, and rules of faith in and over the church, Scripture, in fact, stands at the principium without equal. If they continue to press the issue, resort to granting it, defeating the argument, then breaking it over your knee like so. Even if I grant the premise that the church is the reason why I know Matthew is a valid piece of Scripture, a part of the canon, it does not negate the fact of reality, that how scripture came into being is part of the plans and purposes 
of God that no man or organization here on earth can stop because he is in fact sovereign, meaning we both in the hypothetical or outside of it still realize that the Holy Spirit in his capacity of being part of the Godhead, having absolute power and total control is using the church, man, as an instrument to reveal God's will here on earth in his creation in its written form. When it comes to the Bible, the church should not be boasting over others that we were the ones blessed by God to give the scriptures to the world. Rather, the church should be thankful that God and his sovereign will chose to use this institution as the instrument to do so, giving him, God, the glory. Examining the premise on a theological and then material level itself just goes back to some of what I already said in my opening statement, and more importantly, in God's revealed written decree. It was God's intent from the beginning to make himself perfectly known to his people, and not a thing can be done to stop what God intends to do. And then secondly, externally, on an anthropological, archaeological, or paleographical level, the claim that there should be any questioning of the content of the validity of Matthew being canon is just inexistent. To point out the error as clearly as possible, my opponent sources their certainty in institutions of man. I source mine in the plans and purposes of God. Simple as. They will also say to us, you Protestants are not obeying 2 Thessalonians 2.15, so you're not actually doing solo or tota scriptura. And your response should simply to be uh, exegeting the text and identifying this. The oral component you point to is when Paul preached the gospel in Thessalonica, as stated in Acts chapter 17. The written component is the first letter, 1 Thessalonians, that Paul wrote to the Thess Thessalonians in Thessalonica, which also just contains the gospel. The onus is on our opponents to produce something of credible historical pedigree that teaches what the Thessalonians believed back then is what they believe now. Next, we have, uh, what about those in the past who did not have scripture? Uh, and this is a little bit stressful, but just answer the question. We have always stressed that this is the rule of faith for the normative state of the church today. No one denies during the time of inscription when there were those who literally walked with and next to Paul, Peter, and Timothy, men carried along by the Holy Spirit, were practicing Sola Scriptura. That was never the claim. Then we have the famous uh, Sola Scriptura uh, brought forth, you know, X denominations. Uh, I mean, how much clearer can I make this? Sources are used outside of their intended purposes. That does not discredit the source. Very simple. And finally, the most uh, jaw-dropping accusation that's always made, uh, we're rejecting authorities of church government. Stressful, yes, indeed. But uh, sir or ma'am, the reality is Sola Scriptura is putting God's revealed will over that of the traditions of man. If I need to, I will say it now. I love the church. I submit to my elders, and I recognize this document, the Bible, um, acknowledges and builds up the church as a pillar of the faith. But the pillar never confuses itself with that which, which it is holding up. God's word. Let me end my time uh, in my opening statement with a few verses from scripture that we can review in this debate. Oh man, it's the uh, famous uh, 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17, or only 14 through 17 actually. It's a final charge to Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for your salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 
so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right, sir. Um, I can now just submit over the remainder of my time. Um, I think I had at least uh, two minutes left, but I can give it over to you for your opening statement. Yeah, yeah, there was that was 13. So. OK, um, let me set the timer for me here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, I'm going to, I'll give my opening statement. I wrote a bunch of notes about uh, bad arguments that I heard or uh, uh, non sequiturs that I heard in his opening statement that we'll address uh, later. But um, for my opening statement, I would argue that the uh, Protestant doctrine of Sola Scriptura, at least in terms of the classical reformers, is specifically defined as, even in the, the confessions that he mentioned, which, by the way, the London Baptist Confession is actually just a copy and paste of the Westminster Confession, which, by the way, excludes the elements that they didn't like, so particularly infant baptism, which resulted in two supposed churches with a copy and paste confession out of communion with one another over the issue of infant baptism. So the London Baptist Confession is not the uh, same faith as the Westminster Baptist Confession because it's two different groups independent of one another with no continuity or communion and no continuity with anything that exists in the first thousand years of the church except perhaps uh, elements of uh, followers of Nestorius. But aside from that, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, touch on that later. Uh, I would say that the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, as outlined by the Protestant classical reformers, is that the scriptures are the sole, final authority and infallible rule of faith for the church. So particularly, that's how it's defined. I mean, I know that you gave several sort of qualifiers in your thing, but uh, the classical Reformation doctrine, which is what I'm assuming that you're you're here to defend is that it is the sole infallible and final rule of faith for the church of god um, the problem with this of course is that it's not just a question of one or two verses in thessalonians here or there that might reference tradition i mean i think second thessalonians 2 15 is referencing both written and oral traditions that are binding it's a standing injunction but actually the idea of uh, oral tradition as authoritative is something that was always the case. It was always the case even during the period when we had prophets who had direct revelation of Scripture uh, or, or the Word of God in an oral form and then in a written form because we know, for example, for many centuries prior to the writing of the Law of Moses, uh, it was oral. So we don't, I mean, it could have been written, but we don't know if there was a prior written tradition. What we know of as the Torah is eventually uh, written down and a record of an oral tradition that's providentially preserved. Now, God can providentially preserve the oral tradition from the time of, uh, you know, Abraham, etc., up to Moses. There's nothing preventing God from preserving aspects of oral tradition for the church today. And I will give examples of the very thing that he asked for examples of in his opening statement in a bit. But... Uh, it's in the Old Testament itself that we come to the notion of the law and the testimony, right? So um, Isaiah, for example, makes mention of the law of God, presumably the written text, and the testimony. And Jesus himself, in many places, actually references things that, that are not in the written text of the Old Testament. He mentions in Matthew 23, the seat of or the cathedra of Moses. There's nothing in the Old Testament that says that there's a successive seat of the office of Moses. And yet, when Ezra founded the teachers, teachers of the law of the synagogue, they became the de facto successors to Moses, which is a tradition that Jesus, of course, gives an affirmation to. When Jesus rebukes the traditions of men, it is not all forms of oral tradition, therefore, that he's rebuking. He's just rebuking the Pharisaic accretions and misinterpretations that Jeremiah himself had objected to in the book of Jeremiah, where he calls the scribes and Pharisees of his day liars for adding to and subtracting from the word of God. That does not mean that there's no oral word of God. Now, I know that my opponent admitted that there was a time when there was, say, an oral word of God or so, or, or uh, uh, other perhaps forms in which God had spoken. Um, but what we see is when we go through uh, Old Testament texts, 
themselves we find uh, in many places in the old testament itself again i will give you the example of second chronicles 29 where we have the story of king hezekiah organizing the liturgy right the entire liturgical process on worship of god not on the basis of explicitly written text there's no known written uh descriptor of how the liturgical practice and worship was to be done and yet a few hundred years uh, later they they took the tradition that it existed at the time of david and uh, through this oral tradition they were able to organize this vast liturgical uh, practice and ceremony and that's uh ironic because if you're talking about a person from the reformed tradition who he which he, he said the london baptist confession well both london baptist confession and the westminster, westminster confession of faith reference what's called the regulative principle of worship the regulative principle of worship from the reform perspective is basically that there's nothing allowed in worship that the word of god does not explicitly sanction right that's the classic view and then of course we get reformed and puritan theologians haggling and debating amongst themselves whether that means instruments whether that means only psalm psalm only whether that means women have to wear head coverings etc and there are a multitude of countless denominations of the reformed who are split over precisely those very topics so ironically the very things that they think are regulative principles are actually in the text themselves the old testament not only written form now that's ironic because if you think about nadab and abihu who are castigated for offering strange fire right why would there not have been written form uh, at least in every specific for how the liturgy should be worshiped and yet once again second chronicles uh, uh 29 uh, explicitly is noting that the uh, liturgical worship of Hezekiah is organized according to the tradition and not according to uh, what we know as, of, as written. We know that the Old Testament mentions many texts, right, that are not part of the canonical list of scriptures, such as the Book of the Just, the Book of the Wars of the Lord, uh, the Book of Nathan the Prophet, uh, the uh, Book of Addo the Seer, etc. And what this shows is that even in a period in which the uh, regulative principle, so to speak, was so strict, there was still references within scripture to non-canonical texts as accurate presentations of events and uh, uh, prophecies, right? So the, again, the prophecy uh, of Addo the Seer, the book of Addo the Seer. We don't have the book of Addo the Seer, and yet we're told that it, it includes true statements, true history, and right? he is called a true prophet. So in other words, if it is the case that sola scriptura is true and many times we actually see reformed theologians appealing to old testament texts to prove sola scriptura the irony is of course that in that time period nobody was operating on the principle of sola scriptura and the jews themselves never believed in sola scriptura now perhaps you could argue there's a sect of the jews the Karaites or whatever the the Torah only Jews, that's not the mainstream of Judaism. And it's not the Judaism of Jesus's day that Jesus accepted when he said to the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. Okay. He's not talking about the Karaites. He's talking about the normative Judaism of his day, which he did admit was represented by the scribes and the Pharisees, even though they were wicked, even though they were hypocritical, he did say the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses and therefore they are the legitimate authority and successor. So do what they say, but not as they do. So what this shows is that we know the Pharisees believed in oral tradition. We know that Jesus is affirming the validity of oral tradition. And this is in a period in which most Protestants and Reformed will literally cite texts from the Old Testament and texts from the New Testament before the compilation and determination of the canon to prove sola scriptura. Now, again, I'm not trying to uh, misrepresent my opponent's position, but at one point, and he can correct me if I misheard him when he gives his reply, but he did say something that sounded to me like Paul and Timothy, etc., weren't practicing sola scriptura. Well, if that's the case, then second Timothy, right, uh, is not going to be a proof for sola scriptura, right? Because second Timothy talking about the, uh, ability of the uh, God inspired God breathed scriptures to make the man of God perfect for every good work is by his own admission, not about sola scriptura, right? I mean, it's in a period in which there are uh, other books of the new Testament that haven't been written yet, like the apocalypse right now. Another uh, element that I think we have to get to 
throughout his uh, discussion that was presupposed and never actually demonstrated was the very topic of the canon itself. Now, he did attempt to address one element of debates about the canon regarding the authorship of Matthew, which, yes, I do typically bring that up because the authorship of Matthew is part of the element and, and, and bases for how we know that Matthew should be in the canon. So apostolic authorship is one of the criteria, but not the only criteria per se, right? It's, uh, it's, a, um, it's just one element, but uh, there's more than that because there are many, for example, gospels that were floating around that claim to have apostolic authorship. So something more was needed other than, because we have to have a way, for example, to adjudicate between pseudepigrapha and the actual uh, gospels written by, say, Matthew himself. So this is where the tradition of the church, which he admitted, comes into play. And I appreciate him giving some uh, admission to the tradition of the church. But the irony was that the, uh, the admissions that he gave uh, actually skirted and bypassed the very issue at heart, which is that the list of the scriptures in terms of their canon is just as necessary and infallible as the texts that make up that list, obviously. And I would think that's self-evident, right? Um, because you can't argue for the the uh, inspiration and inerrancy of the scriptures without having a knowledge of the content of those scriptures, right? So we need to know the list of books that goes into that book. And he alluded to the uh, point of what R.C. Sproul used to say, that it's a fallible collection of infallible books. Well, I just take issue with that phrase itself as itself a contradiction. If the infallible list itself is in toto fallible, or the, excuse me, the infallible books themselves are collected in, uh, fallibly, then presumably things can be removed. And precisely in the Reformation, that's what we see. We actually see the reformers removing the books that they find problem with. Luther, for example, famously said that I reject any of the books of the Deuterocanon, Deuterocanon that do not preach the word of God. What is that? Well, it's whatever Luther interpreted to be consonant with his dialectical doctrine of grace versus law. So texts that dealt with works can't be therefore canonical because they don't preach grace and they don't preach the gospel. Now, that's Luther as just an example. I know that my, my opponent isn't Lutheran. I'm just illustrating that, that that's the attitude and principle that we see in the Reformers. And it's not accidental that it's from the Reformed Church in its infancy and from the Lutheran Church in its infancy that afterwards we begin to see the dissecting and removing and destruction of the integrity of the scriptures themselves. Now, my opponent obviously is not a liberal textual scholar, but all I'm saying is that the presuppositions of the ability to challenge the church's authority on the collection of books in the canon is what sets the stage for and allows for the academics to then destroy the rest of the scriptures themselves. So if the church is wrong about the collection of the books, then the church and its historical interpretation can also be wrong about anything else, such as the deity of Christ, right? So in other words, it doesn't work to beg the question about when you're asked about which books make up the canon to say the ones that are correct and in the, and then in the Bible. That's basically what his position said. He did allude to things like tradition. He did admit that he needed the church's tradition. But when uh, confronted with the fact that that would seem to, con to lead to the conclusion that the church at least isn't wrong in this point, right, of the determining of the canon, he alluded to the fact that, well, he said, the Bible is authoritative, Jesus is authoritative, and Jesus is God. But that's begging the question because we're asking about the texts that tell us that Jesus is authoritative and Jesus is from God, right? So the question was about what is the authorship of Matthew? Matthew doesn't identify its author. So to say, well, uh, I'm going to turn to the question of Matthew's authorship on the basis of the Bible's authority. Yeah, that's the thing that's in question though, right? How do we know that Matthew is Matthew's gospel? And the response was, the Bible's authoritative, Jesus is authoritative, and Jesus is God. Begging the question, right? So if you're going to admit that the church has the normative authority in terms of determining the canon, which it does, and that's my, my what I'm going to really end with here, is that not only does the church have normative authority to determine the canon, you actually made an odd uh, statement that, you don't uh, you follow the Bible because the church is an institution of man. 
Well, well, it looks to me like in Acts 2, it's an institution that God created. It's an institution that is the body of Christ. Jesus said, he who hears you, hears me. So he gives to the apostles the very authority that he himself had. He then, uh, in the uh, epistles to uh, Timothy, Paul says, I laid hands on you. You lay hands on men after you who will be able to transmit the things you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. So that's also another attestation to the oral tradition because Paul taught as Acts says, for three years, day and night in Ephesus. And he says to Timothy, the whole deposit of the faith, which you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, pass that on, which includes obviously the scriptures and a milieu, a context from which to interpret those scriptures. And I would add that the New Testament, you'll notice, does not lay down any liturgical pattern of worship. So he wanted an example, the church's liturgy, and we actually have those ancient historic liturgies. And those liturgies, if you don't know, help determine the canon of scripture in the councils. That's my 15 minutes. All right. And I think uh, the cross-examination actually starts with you, sir, cross-examining me. So you want to take over for 10 minutes? I have a timer here and you can set your own timer. Okay, let's go. Uh, so you said that um, first thing I would like to address is the uh, Augustine quotes. Uh, so you gave a, a quote from Augustine that uh, intended uh, or it appeared to try to give the impression that Augustine believed in your doctrine of the uh, authority or final authority or uh, uh, sola scriptura, basically. Is that what you take that uh, quote to mean? Negative, sir. Uh, it's in, uh, I think, when he's actually fighting for the unity of church against the Gnostics, he's simply saying to base all your arguments in scripture. That way you can actually call out the Gnostics. Okay, so you don't think that Augustine believes sola scriptura? Uh, no, I believe that Augustine uh, believes that all of his argumentation should come from scripture. Uh, so uh, another text that I could give for an example is, uh, I am not bound by the authority of Arimnium. And you are not bound by that of Nicaea, by the authority of the scriptures that are not the property of anyone, but the common witness of us both. Let position do battle with position, case with case, reason with reason. This is the works of St. Erasmus Answers to Maximus, part one, volume 18, page 282. St. Erasmus? Oh, St. Augustine. Sorry. I abbreviated. My bad. And I like, I've been reading a lot of Erasmus, ladies and gentlemen. So we're on St. Augustine. My bad. Works of St. Augustine. Okay. So uh, first of all, the fact that so the primacy of scripture in apologetics and argumentation is not the same thing as soul scripture, right? Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I would just, uh, I would, I would allow, the, I would, I would just allow the premise that's trying to be made here and say, okay, if you don't think that what was what was interpret uh, Augustine's interpretation, right? I'm interpreting them wrong. From that passage that I just quoted to you, I don't see any other. But it's not okay, my time so, for well, questions. He could, my been, he could have been saying hypothetically, "Oh, well, you claim to not accept the authority of Nicaea." I mean, do you know, for example, uh, that have you have you read the Canons of Nicaea? Uh, not completely, no, sir. Okay. Do you, uh, if not if if not completely, then in part, have you read them? Yes, sir. Okay. Could you tell me what types of things are in the canons of Nicaea? Pretty much the confirmation of, uh, I would go for, you're right, some of the texts were discussed. Um, they were also talking about some of the deity of Christ or the hypostatic union within Christ, those sorts of things. No. So the, no? Uh, Council, okay. of Nice the Council of Nicaea does not deal with the hypostatic union. Uh, that's Ephesus and Chalcedon. The Council of Nicaea in its dogma deals with the deity of Christ. I'm asking about the canons of Nicaea. Oh, perfect. Uh, educate me. I don't know. Okay, so the canons of Nicaea deal with issues of church law and church governance. This is where we get... Um, now, I mean, there's canon laws, apostolic canons, and apostolic constitutions prior to Nicaea, uh, but Nicaea lists its own canons, and what we see in the canons of Nicaea is things like the uh, episcopate, the offering of the Eucharist, baptismal regeneration, the diaconate, uh, virgins, uh, the... Uh, uh, celibate life viaticum these are all in the canons of nicaea easter okay because we'd already had the quarto decimanarian controversy prior to easter so right. do you do you think uh, augustine believed in the canons of nicaea uh no i think he i think from his quote i would just read it back once again i'm not bound by the authority of arunium and you are not bound by that of nicaea yeah, so he's referencing obviously the councils of nicaea augustine believed well, in the, augustine well, believed well, augustine well, accepted, read, augustine 
So you're quote mining, okay? I'm oh, oh I'm then, trying to then, tell then you let's get the context in. This is a fundamental can... issue okay. of church history. Augustine mm -hmm. accepted Nicaea because he was actually involved in councils, right? Do you understand that the church was synodal? But is he's not demanding his opponent to argue. He's not going to uh, allow make his opponent be subject to Nicaea. That's yeah, the point that's of the whole because quote. the opponent doesn't accept the authority, though. That's not saying that Augustine doesn't believe in the authority of councils, because there's countless places where he does. He he was an episcopate and attended these councils. Okay, so we can allow it and then let this go on and say let's see if you uh, reject this one too i answered therefore I didn't that reject if the authority it. I didn't of scripture has I didn't decided which it. of the don't miss well no 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 I, re I reject it but you can reject that you can reject my quote mining right you call it quote mining that in that quote right there it that is quote he's mining saying, because if you had okay if you knew the well, context, well you can reject you it I'm, I'm allowing it i'm, I'm allowing okay. it i'm going on to something else okay. to see if we can move it move it forward sure I answered, therefore, that if the authority of Scripture has decided which of these methods is right, there is no room for doubting that we should do according to that which is written. Uh, this is Volume 1, Letters of St. Augustine, Letter 54, Section 6. Yeah. So uh, what was Augustine's canon of Scripture? Uh, it was not mine. It was the Apocrypha, but uh, right. we both can realize that he didn't know Hebrew. So he, the only two church fathers who actually knew Hebrew with, was... What does that have to do with the canon of Scripture? Well, it has to do with it because who is trusted with the canon of the Old Testament Scriptures during the time of its actual inspiration? Where, what group of people yeah, it's and what called language the church, are they speaking in every region? Right, so the church determined the canon of Scripture, not the Jews who don't believe in Christ. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I would reject that and say God in his infallible wisdom determined the canon, right? And he is now distributing us to the canon path passively. So I would reject that completely. So, right. So have you read anything about the history of the formation of the canon? The history of the formation of the canon? Uh, yes. It's in this book by uh, Roger Beckwith. It's called The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church. And it goes directly into um, why and how we should actually acknowledge the Jews who in Romans 3, 1 are acknowledged where all the prophets and apostles and oracles are coming from in the Old Testament mm -hmm. who actually came out so with the Old Testament. Did the, did the apostles use primarily a proto-Masoretic text? No, they used the Greek Septuagint. Right. And do so they, they're quoting do from they, that. Do they often cite the Deuterocanon? Uh, no, they're citing no, the Greek Septuagint. You're completely false, completely wrong. The, the, oh, okay. So, the New so, Testament writers, let's the New, test, it. Let's the New really Testament quick. writers in dozens of places reference and cite the Deuterocanonical books. Well, Psalm 102, right? That's no, the group I said, I said dozens well, of places. Okay, cool. Can you give us, or my bad, it's not time, my time to answer questions. You can just take that from me. I'll take the hit. Go yeah, for this it. Is, but it's not even an issue that's in dispute. So you could read a normative work on the canon from a Protestant, from a Baptist, Lee McDonald. He has a whole appendix mm -hmm. uh, of dozens and dozens of references in the New Testament books to the Deuterocanonical text. Gotcha. So, so you're it's, still it's, sourcing. This so, 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 so this is, this is so, where I, I have to assert you're still sourcing your canon, right, in the institutions of man which I see so, as an instrument of God that he used in his sovereign will to communicate to his people. Right. His so so, it's, so I, has, I'm trying to see where this is going to make so it has no normative, you actually go it has into no, the but, so for you, of this. For you, this institution has no normative authority. Uh, no, it has the authority that the scriptures give it. So it has no normative authority because normative authority, authority means that like the Constitution, it's a body of people who interpret the document. Well, I don't think the Constitution is inspired like the Bible it is. Was just so an I analogy. would say once again it that the a... authority, the, the authority given to the script, given to the church, is that from which Scripture, which is given from God, mm -hmm. is given it. When That's did God? Authority. When did God tell the canon to the early church? To the early church. So are we going into the Old Testament Jews? No, the canon of Scripture that the early church mm -hmm. determined. Do you understand that? Oh, in the outpouring. Okay, so uh, Pope. No. No, post crucifixion. Well, there's no finish. list of the Let canon. Where is your evidence for the canon? The canon of where, scripture. Well, well, like I said, it's invested in the ontological nature of the canon, That's, which means so. So, so, the so can, this is where you I'm. Say, this you're is, saying this is, the canon okay. is invested in the in the ontological nature of the canon. Yes. 
that's that's not a good argument. That's a circular well, argument. Well, I believe that scripture is scripture is theopneustos, God breathed, a little breath yeah, of God, so do right? I, but, you referenced but, the seed of but Moses. That doesn't but tell that, you that doesn't I'm tell sorry, you but, the but, list but, of the books. But, let me, but if I had to finish, you referenced the seed of Moses. The seed of Moses is only described once, and I think that's in uh, Genesis. I can't give the exact chapter of it, but no, there no is no scholar who There's actually not, compares what, its what authority to that about? of theopneustos. The seed of Moses is in Matthew 23. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, that's when Jesus is referencing it from Genesis. He's uh, he's he's not referencing it back to it. It's not in Genesis. Okay, where is Moses it? is not in Genesis. Oh, okay, but there is no actual. Uh, how do you say? Do you There's even, never I'm it sure being referenced as theopneustos on the ontological hierarchical level as God breathed. Ontological meaning is. I know what, what the, is I know it? what the word ontology yeah. means. I, I don't yeah. understand what this. Well, well, I'm just tracking because we got to bring people along here, right? I mean, it sounds like filibustering to me. So I, I don't know. Oh, well, I'm just trying to explain my position. My bad. Keep okay. going. I don't hear an argument or explanation for the position. I hear you saying these words. How does that answer right. my uh, question about the church as a historical fact being the ones that debated in six centuries what the canon would be? Well, I think the church is being guided by the Holy Spirit in its when that's the I, I know you think of the Holy that. Spirit. I know you think that. No, no, no. I don't asking. think that. I know that. We know that by the scriptures, sir. That's not a think. That's not a think question. That's actually a fact of no. reality. You, you understand? This is a question of post New Testament for the Correct. first six hundred years. Yes. So I'm asking you about that time period. By the way, my ten minutes is up. If you want to switch it around. Okay. Cool. Cool. And I'll just reset the timer. All right, 10 minutes and let's start the clock. So, sir, can you give us, uh, can you explain to us all what a um, argument from silence is? Can you take a, take, you can take two minutes of my time to do this. Uh, I didn't make an argument from silence, so I don't know what you're, why. No, no, we're, well, well, I'm, I'm trying, I'm going to slowly build a case. What is an argument from silence? I mean, I think it's self-explanatory. It's trying to make a, an argument where there is no evidence of that thing. Perfect. Okay. So uh, you saw my last quote where I gave the scripture where Second Timothy uh, scripture is being ref referenced as theopneustos, right? And it being able to equip the man for every gr good work. In your uh, yeah, it doesn't say that's all. It's in your response, in your response to mine, uh, I, I just want to know. You said at one point, I think um, there is some kind of liturgical authority uh, or liturgical practice. Uh, yeah, they're where called ancient scripture, liturgies. Have you heard? Yeah, of those? yeah. Where in scripture specifically do you get any of the liturgical practices uh, from the that Old would Testament. fully equip the man to actually, you know, write them out just so, from the scripture? So you're, I think you misinterpret that text because it doesn't mention all kinds of things that are necessary for salvation, like prayer or like the gathering together of the saints. So if you're going to restrict that text to only being what's necessary listed in that text, then prayer isn't necessary and gathering together isn't necessary. Got it. Um, going to apostolic uh, and apostolic authorship, uh, Acts chapter 17. I think you know the story. The Bereans are actually in contact with Paul mm -hmm. and they have kind of a back and forth where they're testing him by the scriptures, right? Uh, what does Paul actually respond to them at the end of the test when they say, you know, we got to test you. What does he say at the end of that test? Uh, he applauds them for their knowledge of scripture and for them for going to the scriptures. Okay. So would it be uh, wise for a person in this day when we have, you know, Jehovah's Witness, uh, Mormon, uh, Mormons, all these other, you know, heretical groups that me and you would agree are heretical. They all the time make kind of the same, uh, what, what would you call it? Truth claims. Sure. Right. Good example would be the Book of Mormon right? How would you go against battling the, uh, the Book of Mormon? The same way that I go against battling you, where I point out that we have a historical testimony of a historic church with absolute succession. And so you're basically in the same position as the Mormon. So you would never actually put uh, scripture to test like Paul, uh, put them to the scriptures like the Bereans put Paul to the scriptures? No, I go to the scriptures all the time with heretics, Muslims, atheists, whoever. It's just that I cut it off at the head by that killer argument, which would apply to them and you. 
Perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, would God have failed in here uh, in communicating his will without the church? Or would the church have failed in communing God's will without God's intervention? Where do you place the actual need? Uh, no, because in the Old Testament, God was able to communicate his will without the church uh, in the sense that the church of that time was the nation of Israel. Uh, and then he established a new thing, which was the church, his body, guided by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you into all truth, which didn't end at Pentecost. It still exists. The church is it's not a human institution. It's still here. Okay. The church has the same Holy Spirit as in Acts 2 is what I'm saying, the Orthodox Church. Gotcha. And what, uh, going to the next question, uh, what on what basis did Jesus reject some of the traditions of the Old Testament Jews who obviously fell out of grace because they started coming up with strange traditional practice? Like the mission on the Gomorrah, Gomorrah when you read right. it, you see some because kind of weird they, practices. Because they violated the word of God with their tradition, but the word of God is not equal to only written text so that's your presupposition that i would reject perfect um and then do you think that there are any kind of uh errors within um god's word without the church that cannot be identified uh no i believe in the inerrancy and inspiration of the scriptures perfect and do you think that man is fallible uh, it's a uh, loaded question, complex question, because... Uh, Can man make mistake? Yeah, but I wouldn't conclude from that that the church has erred. Oh, for, for sure, for sure, because, you know, we have a multiplicity of elders so they can check each other for, for that. But in that moment, when you think of inerrant scripture compared to fallible men, what should actually take uh, precedence in decision-making? It's a false either-or. The same Holy Spirit that enlightens the apostles to establish the church at Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit that empowers the church throughout the centuries to have the same message, the same power, the same gifts, the same apostolic succession that it had in the first century. Gotcha. And do you see anywhere in Scripture anything else that is compared to being Theopneustos, god breathed? the word of God that's oral. Gotcha. So, so when Paul preaches day and night for three years in Ephesus, that's the mm -hmm. word of God. Peter says the same thing that he preached the word of God. That's not just written. And so other examples of the things that I gave would be the liturgical worship of the church is also Theonustos as an example. Gotcha. In Acts chapter nine, when uh, the apostle Paul is on the road to Damascus, he goes directly to the synagogue from what principle does uh, Moses argue with the uh, Jews at the time? Where where does he get all his argumentation Paul? from? You don't mean Moses. The Apostle Paul. Paul. Yeah, well, the Jews accept the writings of Moses, so he's going to argue from the thing that they accept, the scriptures. With the scriptures, perfect. And uh, do you not see where the tradition is absent there, where he's only arguing from scriptures? Actually, Paul at times does cite tradition. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's not written anywhere. So Paul refers to uh, Jesus' tradition because John said at the end of Gospel of John that Jesus did and said many things that could not even be contained in all the books of the world. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm just saying that um, the text that you're using, they're, they're not the problem for the Orthodox position because the Orthodox position doesn't deny the primacy of Scripture. It just denies that Scripture alone is the only author normative authority. Is there any group you can identify that has had traditions that have led them to heresy? Well, that because they, put, they, they take well, sure. tradition as equal to Scripture and then it's led them to heresy? Sure, the Pharisees, the very people that you think determine the canon. Perfect. And Catholics? Like we can identify Pope Francis today? Uh, yeah, there are, there are many instances of the traditions of men, absolutely, which uh, replace the word of God, as Jesus said. Sure, absolutely. Gotcha. So would it be not uh, profitable for you know us to take that as an example of this is what happens when traditions are put as presidents equal to or above scripture? Yeah, again, you're just confusing false tradition with true tradition, which the whole argument is presupposing that God's word equals only the written text. And what I said was oh, okay. that God's word is oral in many cases and written in many cases. Do you think that uh, us in our camp don't actually think we have traditions? Do you think we are we, we are traditionalists? Is that your thought? 
No, not at all. That's why I, I try to refer to the, the points where you did invoke tradition and point out that I think it's inconsistent because the very thing that you admit is involved in the canon, you're saying isn't authoritative, but the canon is. Right. And uh, this is how I would say our camp looks at scripture. You have the lens of scripture and then you have tradition. If you look at the position my hands are in, we're looking through the lens of scripture at tradition. Do you think it might be uh, dangerous to switch those positions where you're looking through your tradition at scripture? I think that your analogy is resting on uh, a false presupposition about how texts work. Texts don't prima facie say what they mean and mean what they say. They actually have to be interpreted. So I actually believe ah, that I believe that scripture is part of a tradition. Mm -hmm. The oral teachings are part of that same tradition and that they work together in a harmony and a milieu that is inseparable. Gotcha. I have a string of questions that we're only at a minute left that I want to actually go through. So I'm going to actually seat over the rest of my question time and give it to you. So uh, what's the next, the next what's, what's the next uh, step in the debate? Oh, I forgot. Oh, it's you, you, you cross examine 10 minutes. Okay. Let me... So you have uh, two more cross examinations. Let me get my timer started. <clears throat> All right, I want to go back to um, the list of questions. Or, so the, your, your opening statement. Um, let's go back to um, when you said you said um, you had an interesting phrase in your opening statement. You said that uh, sola scriptura does not mean you with your Bible under. Uh, a tree or something like that right sitting out reading your bible right you said that it was uh it was it was not that and you identified it as that there is some kind of group or church that um you said has el you have elders or something like that so my question yes, um, is okay so my question is do you believe that those elders have the authority to bind you to any decision about scripture in terms of normative interpretation Yes, sir. As long as their interpretation interpretation is grounded in the arguments from Scripture, I am then bound to them. But that does not put them up uh, up above scrutiny. So if I find something wrong, I am able to come to them, and my arguments have to be based in Scripture in order to scrutinize their authority. So there's not normative authority in the church. Uh, we we have normative authority. We just don't put that normative authority above the authority of Scripture. Okay, but what's going to determine that is your individual reading of Scripture, right? So when the elder says you're going to accept this interpretation of this text and you say, I don't believe in your interpretation, you're not bound by that, correct? Uh, it's, a it's a false premise because we actually believe that God's word was delivered with an intention. So there is an intent behind the words so like you write your books which are very awesome by the way when you wrote those hopefully later down the line people will interpret them with the intent that you originally wrote it with that's exactly what we're saying god through the means the outpouring of the holy spirit with yeah, but the that's intention begging, of actually yeah, listing out scripture that's wrote, begging the wrote question. He, there's an there's an objective meaning behind the text i know that you admit and your opponent elder who is trying to bind your your interpretation also believes that there's an objective meaning but what happens when there's a dispute over these meanings for example in the disputes between the arians and the orthodox there was a council called nicaea and athanasius for example writes in his letters that it was the holy spirit who spoke at nicaea so clearly athanasius had the attitude that the council of nicaea was theonustos and the church is bound their their uh parishioners to the inter to nicaea now you could reject that but you'd have to go out and start your own church so what i'm asking is is there an entity a body a group which has normative authority to bind anyone to an interpretation. And you're saying, yes, but it has to fit uh, I, with scripture. I, 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 would, I would just uh, share, the, I would share the opinion that no one holds the scriptures as their own property. Just like Augustine said in his quote, it is the property of the common man from which everyone should base their arguments from. So obviously, if you, does not understand, believe, no, well, 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 if you understand that there is an objective meaning of the text, and then you are in a, in a dispute with another person amongst the scriptures, that objective meaning will come forth. And then obviously the person holding the, fa the fallible position will be proven wrong. Yeah, but I'm asking about a specific example where both sides are appealing to the text of scripture and you don't have any way for the church to 
uh, authoritatively bind anyone. I have I have a perfect example uh, that we can see today. Um, Pope Francis think Pope Francis thinks that gay marriage is okay, right? We agree with that, right? He thinks that, yeah. Or he appears the Catholic the Catholics have given him infallible authority to interpret the text due to papal infallibility. Me and you deny this explicitly. We don't have to argue this. Where we would go wrong with where we would battle him is from the text of scripture saying no, marriage is actually between a man and a woman. Well, but the fact that we would appeal to scripture itself does not disprove the point about normative authority. So it, it's not a question of there is there a guy like the Pope who claims to have it. It's a question of how is the this to be resolved when, for example, on your position, I could uh, reject the existing canon of scripture. You said it's a fallible collection of books. So couldn't I just say, well, I've prayed a lot. I've studied a lot. And um, I've decided that the actual canon of scripture is like uh, two gospels and like one of Paul's epistles. Well, this is where I would say we have to identify whether the authority is being, you know, holding himself above scrutiny, saying that he's the infallible and in, infallible interpreter. When in fact, we know no, I'm just agreeing. Man. I'm agreeing with like you. A, you said it's a fallible collection. So potentially, and this is what happens in the history of the Protestant church and churches is that they begin to dissect the canon and they start taking the books out. And I'm just saying, isn't it true on your position that if it's a fallible collection, then potentially that can happen? Well, that goes back to my opening statement where if you saw the line that I that R.C. Sproul helped me out with, I start with um, the books are at least in a reliable you know, source of what the church is. Then I take that all the way to fast forwarding because I just don't want to do my whole opening statement again, where they actually are the Optimus God read the infallible word. Okay, is the list of the books Theonustos? Yes. So it's God breathed, but it's fallible. I'm sorry? It's God breathed, but it's fallible? Well, the, I'll, I'll put it this way if you would have retitled from Matthew, The Life of Jesus, and then you still read the text, right? And then you put that title in the canon, I would say it's not it's not relevant to the situation. So, you still get scripture because it's dependent I, on I'm the outpouring of the answer. Holy I Spirit. A, so I asked a really okay. specific question about okay. the uh, canon. Okay. Is the list of the books also Theonustos? Oh, wait. And uh, yeah, my bad. Different... My bad. Yeah, my bad. You're right. That's uh, mixing up words. So is the list inf infallible that we have today? No, but God has an infallible listing because he is the author of it and okay. he knows it. Do, do you and have he, do you have the Holy you, Spirit has passed it to Do you have church. access to that God's infallible list? No. Okay, how do you know that exists? Because through his sovereign in, in his sovereignty You're begging the question did, because do you yeah, are you getting that are I'm, you getting uh, that from scripture? We're getting that from the sovereign purposes and will of is God. Is that from scripture? Huh? Yes. For, okay, so now you're circling. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. It's, a, it's just like in Daniel 4, you 34 through 35. That's a circle. Let, let me just quote it. Let me just you're quote begging it. begging the question. For, well, well let, me, let me just quote it. Let's see if you get this. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth account as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and the, uh, the inhabitants of earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you okay. done? Citing a text the interpretation about of that text means that if he, if he has an intent in order to communicate to his church, his elect people, his revealed will, he will do it no matter what. Okay. So no the question organization that I'm on, asking that's you, the, that's the answer. The question I'm asking you is prior to the text. So you can't cite the text to prove the question that I'm asking you. Oh, because so we, can, we can't cite we we can't cite scripture even though God has given it to nope. us. I didn't say you couldn't cite scripture. I'm asking you an epistemic question that is okay, prior well, to well, scripture. So right. every okay, time, okay, prior every, to scripture. Hold on. So every time you cite scripture, you're begging the question that I'm asking you because the, the okay, question okay. is yeah. about the list of the scriptures themselves. Right, right. And I'm gonna say I I, I would say this. Um the text, the scriptures, right? 
are a fact of reality before they were written, right? Okay, we that's know a t that's a T. Well, well, wait, 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 but was it reality but, is a T. Well, 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 what is was it a fact before it where was written that uh got the, the verse I quoted, was that a fact of reality or did that have to be written for it to be made true? You said it was in the mind of God, and I asked you if you had access yes, to that. Yes, I, I, I agree, I, but I, I'm saying- I asked saying, you if you had access to that, and you said no. Well, well, well I'm saying that if so you, you don't, don't have access, access to it, you don't well, have if you access, don't have access so to it, it still no, makes it true, your, right? I'm just asking your position. How do you, if well, you don't well, have yeah, access my, my, to it, how do you know if you don't have access to it? How do, how do I know? Because no matter if it was written or not, it still happened in time. It took place. That event was sovereignly decreed by God. It and happened. You, you can't refute that. The list of the canon of scripture that is infallible is, in, it is, fallible, is in the right? mind of God. The one that no, 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 no. We, we have the, the list that is in said, God's right? mind. Well, okay. My bad. My bad. Then I misspoke. I'll say it this way. The list in the father's head is infallible. What he has given to us and what we know is fallible. Okay. We, how do you know that first? Prophet? Scripture. Scripture you, is it. How do you know? Scripture is an artifact of revelation. You know first, it is not. It is not an object of revelation. That first. Do you understand that? That first proposition. How do you know that? How do I know that God is sovereign? No. You know what I'm asking you about the infallible list in God's okay, mind so, that you have no access to. We don't have access to okay, the mind of God. Yes. That's my time. So. You okay. Wanna, what's next right um i get another 10 minutes okay, okay. so uh you've written m many books before right two books perfect okay uh we both agree that letters are just symbols when those symbols come together f to form words those words are used to define an intent right we can agree on that right there's a purpose yeah, to a sentence you write correct Sure. Now, when you put pen to paper, naturally, uh, a, a canon started to take place in your mind, correct? That you infallibly know. A canon? No. A canon listing of the books that Jay Dyer would write, correct? You don't know. We don't know if Jay Dyer, uh, we don't know the infallible listing of Jay Dyer's books, but we know Jay knows his infallible listing of books, correct? Because you, you put pen to paper the moment you started, correct? So this is a question of history. That's the problem here. So, well, well, I'm just trying to get the concept. I'm just trying to get the concept across is you've written books with an intent and you have a listing of those books that you may or may not write in the future that no one else infallibly knows but you, correct? Yeah, but you have access to my list of books. You don't have access to the thing that you said. I would have to. I, I would have to ask you though, right? I would. I would. And even when you answer me, say time, thirty years goes by, mm -hmm. my my list of oh, I know Jay is going to be coming out with a book this said year, kind of kind of trails off, correct? Because you may have decided to make a new book, right? Okay. Right. Okay. Perfect. Do any of the books down through history? lose their objective meaning when you wrote it with the intent that you did over time do they change no perfect now can you see how that concept comes over to scripture where no. we're talking about interpret totally, no totally false analogy right so you used so you used words right did the apostle paul use words uh when he was writing the letter to the ephesians the fact that I use words and Paul use words, what is that? Yeah. Everybody well, when you words. wrote your book, there was an intent behind it, right? right. Sure. You were trying to transmit a, a specific message. Sure. When Paul was talking to the Ephesians, we both know that they're going through a time of, uh, you know, there's a battling over who has uh, rights over the covenant, right? Covenant of God, mm -hmm. the Gentiles or the Jews. Okay. That's the whole argument, right? So okay. he's addressing that issue and he's trying to transmit over the intent right of no you both are now one in christ correct sure that is an objective meaning of ephesians yeah i agree with that oh perfect okay so if a church body government comes up with any other different interpretation of the general meaning or the intent of that text can we challenge them on the basis of no the objective meaning of this text is not what you're saying in your interpretation so can we do that 
Uh, you can, but it's not the same question as the epistemic question of what books are in the Bible. So you keep confusing the two questions. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure that we can get an objective meaning from the Word of God for right now. That's what this line of question is. So the fact that texts are interpreted does not mean that there's not objective meaning that's derived from the text. Of course, we can what derive, uh, what, what other objective meaning can you get from Paul writing a letter to the Ephesians addressing their uh, battle over who has rights to the covenant. So this is a the other objective. This meaning is a loaded question about the meaning of text because texts don't have one meaning. They're interpreted. And that's what I'm trying to say earlier about. There's no such thing as the text just means what it says and says what it means. Every text of scripture is interpreted within the light of the rest of the text of scripture and within the light of the canon that the church determined and her liturgical practices. That's why I referenced liturgy, because the liturgy was one of the key things that the church fathers looked at, aka the lectionaries, to determine the canon. Did you even know? Were you aware that the are, church, are, are, well? Are, are there any text? Well, this is my question, Tom. Are there any texts that you know state objectively who who God is? Are there any texts like that that just stated objectively? I think of Isaiah ten. Yeah, but the fact that it states Isaiah that, 43, 10, sorry. Yeah, but that doesn't mean the texts aren't interpreted and that they aren't part of a web or a matrix of other connected texts. I mean, I, are, I agree. I okay. agree. What what is enough if we're just looking at I focusing on Isaiah 43:10? What is another objective meaning from that text that you can get other than the nature of the nature and the who and the what is is God? So the question is not about can you derive meanings from the text. The text, the the point is that a text doesn't stand alone. That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm oh, not oh saying, for sure. I'm not saying yeah. you can't read Isaiah and understand what the text is talking about, but it's only going to be understood in the light of all the others and in the context of the church. That's what I'm saying. So Agreed. you're, just, you're so, asking me so, questions so in, that in, I don't in, disagree in, with. Well, I, I know. I, well, I'm not trying to make a disagreement with you. I'm just trying to show you that there is an objective meaning to the text. So say you talked about it's in, I would say in this context, is a category error. You're confusing okay, categories because I'm not disagreeing with objective means to say that the texts are interpreted does not mean they don't have objective meanings. It's just to simply Perfect. say that they're not uh, prima facie. But we know that there are church uh, church organizations, the Watchtower Bible, right? They think that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Mm hmm. What is the objective, actual interpretation of the text of who Jesus is? He's God. We agree on that, right? Yeah, but that doesn't answer the the objection well, about how texts are interpreted. The fact that you right. and I, the I, fact I, I, that I'm trying. What I'm trying to get to is that there is a church government, right, an authority, a normative authority called the Watchtower Society, who makes publishments to their Jehovah's Witnesses that give them a false interpretation. But if the clergy so were smart enough, well, this is what I'm getting to. If the clergy was smart enough to actually go into the word of God, they would be able to actually challenge their authority, right, from the grounds of scripture and say, no, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, Jesus is God, correct? Well, no, because on the one hand, they actually have a mistranslated book, right? The, their New World Translation actually removes a lot of the references to Christ, so... In fact, no, you can't just go to the book because they have the wrong Bible, which is similar to what you have, the wrong Bible. Oh, so you cannot use the Bible that... I mean, are you that aware you can't of the, use that? You can't, well, yeah, are you yeah, aware I know. of the New World yes, Translation? I, yes, yes, I am. Can, okay. can you not... Well, I'm able to use the New World Translation to actually even prove that Jesus is God because there are certain things that they don't have edited like that. And I yeah, know but, it's a it's a it's a doctor. It's it, it doctors the original original languages, the original uh, translation. So of God. I totally are you agree. familiar? Right. But you keep just saying that we can go to this text. We can go to that text. We can go to that text. Do you understand that the questions that I was asking were pretextual? Oh, well, right. I, I, I'm totally getting that. But you're, you keep relying on pretextual as in God does never have a purpose to communicate his will to God. I never said that's, that. That's the whole problem. I never said that. I don't know where well, you got that. Well, well, how about this? The church will get scripture if they have God, right? You need God in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to use the church as an in instrument to get the scripture, correct? 
I think God providentially used the church because Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be given to the church and it, it would never leave the church. And so therefore, I, I totally, that's how I the totally, church determined the canon. And I, and I totally agree. Now, no, you without don't agree with that. the operation, you don't, without, you don't the whole, without the, well, well, watch this, watch this. Without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, can the church know the will of God? Of course not. And would, would without the church, God have failed to communicate his word to his people? That's an impossible question because he chose to use the church. That's the oh, whole point. Oh, for, for, for sure. What group do we know that, that fell from grace was responsible for scripture? No church that was responsible for scripture except for the Palestinian Jews, Jews. failed. Right. So they were an instrument mm -hmm. that after a time totally derailed, yep. lost their meaning, right. but still were used providentially yeah, but by the sovereign God to prior communicate to his word. Pentecost. So you, you, what you're not getting is the importance of Pentecost and redemptive history. Well, I think what you're not getting is uh, no. You said the, the church, the sovereign. Well, 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 let me finish. You said I the think church. what you're not getting is the sovereign will of God. Because think about it this way. Well, so you, have I mean, you don't believe that, you well, don't believe that God is sovereign and powerful enough to use the church. Oh yeah. Well, well, well let, let, you let's said it was that. a human let, institution. Let, let, so, so let, the let's say, let's you think that. the church failed. You think the church? Uh, no, 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 no. I don't think the church failed. I think the church would fail without God. But here we no, go. No, no. Uh, you believe the church? Let's let's give an example really quick. Let's go to an example. Let's go to an example of the sovereignty of God. Genesis 50, right? Joseph, he's just met back up with his brothers after they sold him into slavery. He says a, a, a very uh, key quote to them. What you meant for evil, God meant for good, right? Why would you think I deny the providence and sovereignty I'm not, of God? I, I, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that we are instruments used by God to uh except for the church in the first to to, to take to put down no 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 except no for the, the church, church you don't believe no no the church, no, no. no. Well, you don't, well, well you, you, you don't need to read that. my well that's my you opening statement that. well that was my in my opening statement if you listen the church should not boast about being the instrument that god chose to use in order to communicate his that's words funny because paul they said the church be, is the they body should, so they, they, they should the be grateful the they should be they should be grateful that they were the instrument used by God in his sovereign will to communicate the word to the world. So now you're admitting that they were uh, used in the first. Session. No, 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 no. I'm, Id I'm identifying, I'm identifying that it is God's sovereign will, which it is all dependent upon that we have, you the, have will, a false the revealed dialectic. will of God. This is a false dialectic between the church and God's sovereignty. So uh, I, keep I, I only have a minute left, by the way. So this will be your final response. Go for it. My bad. Keep going. Well, is it who, whose turn is it? What do you mean? Oh, uh, I actually think we're done. I think that was it. And then well, that was uh, cross now, examination. Now, oh, no, that right. was cross closing examination. Statements. And then there's closing statements. So, right. Uh, cool. You said as long as you want, and then I'll let you go as long as you want. And then we'll what? You want to open up for QA? Right. Um, so I think what's happening here is uh, we are trying to communicate in, well, in the on. essence of the rule of faith that, oh, is this not a closing statement? The, the, it's supposed to be mine. Oh, my bad. Yeah, go for it. I mean, that's how I have, you have it listed. I don't. No, no, no. You're right. Really you're right. You, you're correct. My bad. I'm, I'm just jumping the gun here. It's okay. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give my closing statement. I'll try to keep it as quick as I can just to kind of re review and recap. Um, my take initially uh, is that the Jews themselves uh, had it correct when, even though they had the written text, they had the oral tradition, they did not believe in soul scriptura. Um, I think that's pretty uh, easy to demonstrate. And so when Jesus is preaching and, and doing his ministry, you know, he refers to the oral traditions. He refers to things that are correct in oral tradition, as well as the written text. And as well as rebuking the non-consistent accretions and replacements of bad traditions. So there's the written text, there's the oral tradition, and then there's the false tradition. And Jesus, I think, speaks of all of those. And so Jesus himself, I don't believe, thought, taught and thought in the sense of Sola Scriptura. And we get in the New Testament, when we come to Paul's epistles, as I gave you multiple examples, Paul continues to say, not just in 2 Thessalonians, but throughout 
uh, the epistles to Timothy, that he wants Timothy to pass on the entire inheritance, uh, excuse me, the, the, uh, the entire uh, uh, deposit that he heard in the presence of many witnesses for three years to, the, uh, to, uh, to those who uh, Timothy would lay hands on, and thus there would be, in my view, an apostolic succession. So uh, I think the, the Pauline letters themselves, beyond even Second Thessalonians 2.15, have the standing injunction to pass on the oral tradition. When we get into the post-apostolic period, what we find is that there was not any uh, explicit uh, list of how to do the worship services in the church. This itself, I think, is an implicit refutation of the Reformed view as a whole, but particularly in regard to the regulative principle of worship. Because if you know the Reformed faith, typically it's not just a question of sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is hammered home when it comes to not worshiping God in a way other than his written text mandate. So my challenge there is, well, it seem, it stands to reason that God would have laid down then a, an explicit written way that the church was, should and would do liturgical worship, and yet we do not have that. There is no New Testament writing or doctrine about how to conduct the church's worship services, and yet the Reformed tradition hammers the fact that Nadab and Abihu are examples of those who would try to innovate and come up with humanly devised ways to worship God. Now, guess what? In the early church, there's not a single uh, historian or scholar of the tradition of liturgy, right, of the, uh, litur liturgical historians. And I could give you a list of multiple ones like Hugh Wybrew, Williams and Anstall, uh, etc., who talk about the fact that the earliest days of the church did not have a canon of scripture. And yet they had whatever writings they had in the various seas, the ability to worship in a pattern, a liturgy. And in fact, in many of Paul's epistles, Many uh, exegetes and scholars from multiple traditions admit that Paul in many places is actually citing liturgical hymns and liturgical worship elements in his New Testament epistles. So what that shows us is that we do not have a pattern of worship other than what is in the temple and synagogue systems that the church adopted and then put into what are called apostolic liturgies. Some of these in their uh uh, seed form still exists today. Guess where you can find those? They're called Orthodox liturgies. When you go to the Orthodox liturgy, when you see the liturgy of St. Mark, when you see the liturgy of St. Basil, when you see the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, when you go to the Latin rite and you see the liturgy of St. Peter, those are all ancient patterns of worship that are not explicit in scripture and yet are laid down in apostolic churches as even many Protestant theologians and scholars have admitted. Particularly, for example, Philip Schaff, in his famous History of the Church, he lists the apostolic succession of the bishops of Rome. So there you can see from a Pro famous Protestant scholar, fam one of the most famous works of Protestant church history, the admission of, at the See of Rome, successors of bishops. And guess what? It's not any different anywhere else because this is the pattern that Paul laid down to Timothy. So I say all that to point out that when we actually go and read Protestant scholars like F.F. Uh, Bruce's book on the canon of Scripture or when we read Lee McDonald's book, The Formation of the Canon, what we see is a, an admission from prominent classic Protestant evangelical scholars that the church's liturgy is one of the easiest examples of tradition that played a key role in determining the canon of Scripture. And one way we know that is what's called lectionaries. Lectionaries were the daily readings in the apostolic sees and churches where you would walk in the various days of the week in the churches in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, and you would hear the organized readings of the Scriptures in accordance with the saint of that day, the lives of the saints, and the liturgical textual readings that day. Guess what? If you go to Orthodox Church and you go throughout the year, you will see and hear the exact same thing. So what we have is, in the church today, the exact same pattern and expression of the way the church worshipped in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th centuries. And what you learn as well when you look at the history of the canon is that it's debated for many centuries. Six centuries from the Orthodox vantage point, because, of course, we don't just accept de facto what Rome says. We look at the ecumenical canons and councils, 
And it's the sixth council for us that has the sort of final statement on what the canon of scripture is. So, so for the Orthodox church, when we look at this and we look at, for example, St. Athanasius going and convincing Rome to include Hebrews and Revelation in the canon, we see that the formation of the canon itself is nothing like my opponent exclaims uh, or claims and exclaims and assumes, right? The whole presentation was totally, totally out of accord with the actual admitted Protestant historical approach to the formation of the canon. I'm not aware of any Protestant scholars that, uh, in fact, there's a whole chapter on Athanasius doing that very thing to the Church of Rome to convince them to include Hebrews in the Apocalypse. Now, if that's the case, then my opponent who kept setting God's sovereignty over against the instrument of the church, here's a key example from the providential history of the church where Athanasius, as an instrument of God's providence, goes to Rome and convinces them of these disputed books to be included in the canon. So the very thing that he's asking for, I'm going to give the example that Lee McDonald covers in that whole chapter in his book that, yeah, Athanasius convinces Rome. He convinces the Pope to include these books in the canon because the East accepted those books. So moving on, um, I think that a lot of his argumentation was premised on the presupposition that the uh, word of God equals written text. Uh, my whole re uh, reply to this was just simply that that's not true. The word of God equals written text and oral tradition, both. And I gave multiple examples. In fact, uh, he asked for, uh, in regards specifically to the Thessalonians, he said, can you produce any oral tradition that would be in accord with what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 about the oral tradition? Yeah, I would be happy to. It's called the Church of Thessaloniki. The Orthodox Church in Thessaloniki is the same Orthodox Church that Paul wrote to in Thessalonians. Thessaloniki. We have an ex a succession of the bishops of Thessaloniki back to exactly what Paul is writing about. So you want an example? Yes, it's actually a church over in Greece in Thessaloniki. Father Peter Hears is over there a lot. <laughs> so there you go. There's one example and they have a liturgy there. And that liturgy is fundamentally no different than it was in this apostolic period. So there's one response to that objection that he asked. So moving on, um, I would point out that uh, he mentioned, the, uh, uh, I, I want to uh, highlight this, not because I, I, I think that it necessarily disproves all of Protestantism, but it is worth, again, reemphasizing that our friend is not in communion with all of the people that he claims are part of the Westminster Confession. So he believes the London Baptist Confession, but the London Baptist Confession is literally a copy and, pa copy and paste job that just deletes the sections about infant baptism. So again, to say, oh, I believe the London Baptist Confession and you could also look to the Westminster Confession is kind of disingenuous when it comes to the fact that those two groups, at least historically, killed each other. Yes, Calvinists, Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Anglicans, they've not typically been good buddies. They've killed each other. So the idea that they're just they're sort of in this loose confederation of reformation is simply not true. Uh, moving on. I want to also mention again that uh, I think that the quotes from uh, Augustine uh, do not prove anything close to what he's saying. They're quote minds because there's countless places where Augustine consistently references tradition, has a totally different canon from our friend, uh, does not teach anything like what uh, the, the, the Baptist church teaches, the Reformed Baptist church teaches. So we know that Augustine was a bishop. We know that he taught uh, relics. He taught uh, all the things that we believe. So he's one of our guys. That's all I'm trying to say. So I don't see how he's going to, uh, uh, afford you any evidence at all. Um, moving on, I would say that uh, I never heard a uh, convincing response to the question of how you know that you actually have the right canon. And in fact, I proposed the situation where hypothetically I could come along and um, disagree and come up with my own canon. And that's actually what we see in the history of Protestantism. And I don't see on what basis he would have a problem with that if it's a fallible list of books. And so when I asked him where the infallible list is, and he said that it's in God's mind, and then he compared that to me writing various books, uh, it's a false analogy because the actual process of the history of the canon doesn't match up to the way that I write books, right? So if I wrote books and taught a bunch of stuff, and then I had a bunch of like disciples in a cult around me or something like that, and then in the next few centuries, they collected together 
right? And I gave them the authority to determine what my books were and what I said. That might be a better analogy because that's what the church is, right? Acts 2 is in accordance with what's in John 14, 15, 16 about Jesus teaching that the coming of the Holy Spirit will be such that the church will be empowered. The church will have the same presence of the Holy Spirit that she had at that time at Pentecost, right? The, the, the Spirit didn't leave. But what I hear in the Reformed faith, and I know because I used to be Reformed, is a church that is in like propositional realm. It's not an actual historical entity because that thing failed. That church of the first six centuries, he said, was puffed up and bragged and presumably failed because he's not in that church, right? I mean, I can go read the first, you know, six centuries of the church fathers and see what they taught. They taught baptismal regeneration. They taught the real presence. They taught the kind of scripture that he rejects. Uh, they taught that the church has the authority to bind people's consciences in the councils and in, in synodality. They had an episcopate. Uh, they practice infant baptism. They practice all these things that he rejects and thinks are corruptions and failures. So at a fundamental level from his position, the church completely failed. And I don't see how that's in accordance with Matthew 16, 18, uh, 16, 16 to 18, which says that the church as a visible body and institution founded on the apostles and their successors. He who hears you hears me, Jesus says that it would just fall apart. And yet, but they got the canon right. Oh, and they got the deed of Jesus right. I mean, that, they got that. Oh, they got the Trinity right. Uh, but everything else, oh, they're totally wrong. Like they just, they just fail. It was a giant failure, but good news uh, in the reformation, Luther comes and he saves and rescues the true gospel. Now uh, in Eustitia day by Alistair McGrath, Eust McGrath admits that prior to Luther, no one taught Luther's version of sola scriptura. I'm excuse me, uh, of the solas basically. And he's talking about justification, but I think we can extend that to, the other solas as well. We don't see that in the church fathers. That is a, um, a totally missing, right? And that's why the simplest way to demonstrate that is that our friend Pedro, James White, any of these people, they aren't in the Orthodox Church. They're not in communion with any linked historical group at all because obviously they think those groups have failed and fallen away. And yet what we constantly see is a reliance on but they got the canon right. But they got the deed of Christ right. But I like Nicaea. Oh, but let me reinterpret the Nicene Creed when it talks about, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So it's really just a ruse, right? And I'm not trying to be uh, mean, but I'm just saying Protestantism as a ruse. I'm not trying to implicate uh, our friends. So moving on as I, as I close, um, I would say that uh, one thing that he said that was, uh, again, I'm not trying to be mean, but he said the Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead. No, fundamental Trinitarian theology uh, does not hold that God has parts. So uh, don't ever say God has parts. So I think that Trinity 101 would tell you God doesn't have parts. There's no, there's no Godhead parts. If you, right. if you had studied the church fathers, you would know that the Trinity comes first. So maybe instead of assumptions and presuppositions about Sola Scriptura justification, maybe you should study like Christology first and the Trinitarian theology first, because you talked about God's providence. What's interesting that in God, in God's providence before the canon of scripture, the church was operating with a liturgy and was determining in her formulations, the Trinity and Christology before there was a publicly acknowledged, completed, closed canon of scripture. So we operate that way. You operate in the, the inverse way in terms of how the Reformation Protestant churches think about Christ and salvation. I think that's a big problem here. Um, he said, uh, the church is an institution of man. I don't think the church is an institution of man. The church is an institution made up of men that has a divine origin. I believe the church is the extension of the incarnation following Paul because we are the very body, the very limbs, the very eyes, the very hands of Christ himself. Paul says, and that's because the church is a divine institution. It's a theonustos institution. It's a theanthropic institution, just like Christ himself is theanthropic because he's the God man. So his body shares in the same deification and power that he himself possessed his body, the church to say that the church loses its fundamental constitution, power, and spirit would, would be to essentially say that Christ's incarnation does not achieve its effect 
and Christ is now divided, and a Nestorian ecclesiology is the result. So by default, your Christology is Nestorian as a Reformed person, which 90% of the time they are, and your ecclesiology is Nestorian. So I can just simply say that that's another way to refute this whole thing. Um, and... Uh, Oddly, you admitted that the, you said the church is the pillar and ground of truth, but the church as the pillar holds up God's word. Your, so your interpretation of that was the inverse, the opposite of what it actually says. So you read it like we have to remember what the church holds up, which is the word of God. And so the church is actually built on the word of God, the written text. And so you reverse the meaning. So I just had to call you out on that. I think that the point of that text is the very opposite of the reading that you gave it. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 about the uh, ability of the scriptures to make a man uh, good, uh, sufficient and ready for every good work uh, does not prove sola scriptura. And I give many examples of how that's the case. Um, the fact that it's able to make you wise and, and, and so forth. The text doesn't mention anything about gathering together in church, uh, taking the sacraments. Uh, uh, prayer. So would we conclude that that's literally all that's necessary is what's listed in the text. And so I don't have to pray. I don't have to go to church. Well, on your reading of the text, that would seem to follow, which is absurd. So in, in the context of the rest of scripture, there's not even a new Testament canon completed yet. So that how could this text prove sola scriptura when it's prior to the new Testament, even fully being written, John hasn't written his apocalypse yet. So again, sola scriptura, I think, presupposes multiple things. And primarily my argument was about the epistemic preconditions for going to the text. I want to know how you have the right list, which you said is fallible. And then you turn around and said, but that is the, the actual list is in God's mind, which we don't have access to. But I know that my list is right because it's the word of God. That is a circle. And so appealing to the text doesn't answer. It just presupposes a thing that I'm asking about, which is the contents of the text itself. So I don't think I ever heard an answer to that specific objection. Uh, and I think that that's why um, the case for my position, the Orthodox Church, its tradition, its liturgy as the context for how Scripture is known and the, and the factual, historical, uh, undisputable thing, uh, uh, truth that the church used her liturgy and her tradition to determine the canon, which he essentially admitted proves my position. All right, first one we get into mine. All right, let's start with a quote from Clement. Uh, my opponent here tonight said that uh, in the first six centuries of the church, no one believed what we believe, but uh, let's, let's, let's try and test that really quick with this quote. It's from uh, the first letter of Clement. Uh, to the church of Corinth, uh, section 45, and it states like this, be competitive and zealous brothers, but about the things that relate to salvation, you have searched the holy scriptures, which are true, which were given by the Holy Spirit. You know that nothing unrighteous or counterfeit is written in them. Uh, this debate was uh, supposed to be about um, asking what is the rule of faith actually for in its practice? And I think uh, I need to restate the questions that actually make it operate to make sure that comes across correctly. What, and those are the, these are the questions. What tradition do you want to oppose, impose on us that cannot be found in scripture? Um, so far, we got the tradition, but we never had it solidly grounded in scripture. Uh, by what standard does the creators of this tradition claim their authority um, even though I, I, I was trying to lead us to it, I never saw anything uh, referencing anything else aside from the scriptures that, you know, were charged to Timothy by the Apostle Paul as they off new stocks. I never saw I never saw any of that come forward in this uh, practice, law, rule, doctrine or dogma, dogma. Is it contradictory to scripture? And I think this is really the key here. We're asking, uh, are we going to be uh, in contradiction to good God's revealed words? I think this is what separates us from uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the, every every cult group that you think of, even the, even the Catholics. And uh, I, I don't know, I was accused of quote mining, but here, here, here's another quote from Augustine to see if I'm actually taking it out of context on your own, ladies and gentlemen, go and read it. It is this, uh, whoever dissents from the sacred scriptures, 
even if they are found in all places in which the church is designated, are not the church. De Unitate Ecclesia, uh, Caput, Volume, that is four. Translation by Francis Turrentian, Volume, oh, it's actually Volume 3, page 109 to 110. We have another one. Uh, Let no one say to me, what hath Donatus said? What hath Permian said? What hath Pontius or any of them? For we must not allow even Catholic bishops, if at any time, perchance, they are in error, to hold any opinion contrary to the canonical scriptures of God. Uh, we're, we're simply asking our, our, our friends here on the Orthodox, on the other side of the Bosphate, to, you know, examine their traditions through the lens of scripture. We're not saying you need to throw away all your traditions. We have traditions. But the difference, I think, here between our two parties is that we are able to take tradition and examine it through the biblical lens and not the other way around. Um, and then finally, because I want to keep it short and concise, uh, we here in this conversation, I think, never actually got to, uh, you know, examine what or, or, or get a, a direct admission of will the church be able to succeed without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? I wish I would have asked that question before. I think I did it in a different form, but I didn't because my position, like uh, my opponent tries to misquote me, but I'm thankful that I made a clear opening statement. My position is that the church succeeds dependent on the sovereign. And I totally agree. It's not a part the Holy Spirit is completely God, so he got me there. I think I may have misspoken. The Holy Spirit is part, uh, holy God and therefore is also sovereign, but is dependent on the Holy Spirit whether or not we successfully get scripture. That's all I would say in on the basis of where scripture comes from. And uh, I would close it there. I'm sorry? Are you okay to do the super chat Q&A? Oh, for sure, for sure. Okay. Can we pull it on screen, or, or you can just read it? I trust. No, you. I just Go read them. I don't. I don't get that fancy. <laughs> Chill. Nah. Okay, so uh, if you guys would feel, uh, be sure to hit like and share, and uh, I want to thank uh, Pedro for coming on. It was a lively debate. I enjoyed it quite a bit, and uh, it was civil. It was friendly. It was heated. It it was good. So. Uh, we'll go with the super chats now. And uh, if you want to super chat, ask a question. It's through Streamlabs. So if you guys know that I not put the I didn't put the Streamlabs link, did I? Um, could one of you uh, mods hook me up there and put the Streamlabs link in for us? Yeah, thank you. Exposing powerful lies. Let me let me copy that and add that to uh, the show description here. Oh man, that's not right. And then we'll get to this. Just one second. Let me get this link. All right. So I'm only I'm only going to be taking the super chats, and you can direct them to whoever you want, me or him. Please keep them obviously within the bounds of what's like acceptable on the platform. Uh, anything crazy, we won't be reading it. Green feathers for five dollars says uh, Pedro is not a theologian. Volpace for five dollars says thank you pedro god bless you jay uh please both pray for us in australia hey amen uh if i have to say that my i have actually been praying for australia it's crazy what's happening there it's pretty stupid green feathers for five dollars quote gotcha pedro gooster five dollars pedro should take time to reflect on what is actually being said by the orthodox if incorrect, calling the body of Christ his uh, theanthropic church, the traditions of men, would go would be along the line toes the line of blasphemy. David, five dollars. You are both smart, and thank well, you. Well, can I can I respond yeah, to that sure, really quick? Sure. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I have uh, in my, some private conversations been actually talking about uh, or talking to um, Orthodox men, and if I have to say, every time I interact with a group. I'm primarily concerned on the identity of Christ because I think that obviously that's the way anyone is saved and the Christology is there is solid. So if anything, uh, I would not be combative about like the identity of Christ, which is particularly 
pivotal to a, man, a person's salvation within the Orthodox Church. Mm. And my, I haven't, I haven't de- dove in uh, deep enough, obviously, to get into other things. But I would, I would not say outright every tradition in the Orthodox Church is evil and you know contradicts the Word of God. Well, one thing that the Christology uh, leads to is the impossibility of uh, Calvinism. So if you're going to be a Calvinist, you can't believe what's in Ephesus uh, at all. So uh, moving on, it's uh, David. No, that's David says for $5, you're both very smart. Thank you for presenting your sides. That was a learning experience for me. Thank you very much, David. I just read the text $5. Could the people outside of the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 have just told that council, sorry, that isn't my reading of the text? I think that's a question. Uh, yeah, I see. I see the question. I would say. Uh, I, mm, I would want to read it and go over it more so I would pass it. Um, I would say no. So Boomer Man, one, two, three, one dollar. Pedro, would you please inform us of an example of you or your Protestant tradition viewing the tradition through the lens of Scripture? Um, Sola Scriptura is, in fact, a tradition saying this is the word of God inexplicably. That's the presupposition that we're writing on. It is Theopneustos, right? Therefore, no other um, authority in the church can come above it. And when it comes to an objective meaning, that's it. Boom. Let me see. The next part of that question was, uh, what is the mechanism in history that you appeal to to know the canon? Um, to know the canon, like I said before, my opening statement is dependent on the purposes and will of God. Okay. How does the that will tell you the sorry. canon? Well, he wants me to know something, so he will communicate it to me. Okay, but but so we believe in Calvinism, right? When okay. he created hold, us. Hold on. Okay, sorry. But no, okay. when you say his will is for us to know something, you said earlier that that's a truth that you derive from Scripture, right? Well, that's a truth of reality, right? I don't believe no, no, no. that. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't. I, this is equivocating here, so. How do right, you know right. God? How do you know God's will for you? you do, appealing well, to reality well, doesn't. Well, matter. well, God exists, right? He's the sure. sovereign creator, right? Okay, but do you know that we get that? Way? We get that through. So, so how here's a good conversation. The, actually, origin, let me, what is the origin well, me, of that let, knowledge? Well, well, let me. Oh, the so, origin of the knowledge that God exists is in general revelation, as opposed no, to your, his salvific, will for you. Salvi- his will for no, you. No, 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 no. Well, well, think about this. Think about this. There's a general revelation and is there, there's a no, salvific you're scary, revelation, you're, correct? You're avoiding the question because you know I'm asking you about something that you learned from Scripture. And I right. you never answered what is pre-scriptural, an epistemic question about how you know. Well, you don't, you don't, uh, how do I say uh, this? Yeah. There is a God, right, who maintains and creates everything, Right. That can be okay. seen throughout you know general that? revelation without the Bible, right? Okay, but like if I look around, if, if I look around, if I look around, there is order here, right? This is not just random. I didn't come from the primordial goo like the atheists say or something like that. There is a God who created us with a purposeful, a purpose, okay, right? So, and general, intent. so you're going to appeal to general revelation to know the canon. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm going to appeal to general revelation just to know that there is a God, right? Okay, salvific so that, so, salvi- salvific revelation tells me that god is sovereign right okay so wait a minute now i'm confused so you're appealing okay. to natural theology to say that there's a god is that a god without any content i, I, I i'm appealing to the fact that there it we exist right there has to be a mover the unmoved mover is god we know we, we agree okay, on so this. your god is aristotle's god no 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 our our god is the well, god the unmoved of mover is aristotle that's his God. Well, uh, okay. So did, is there any cause that brought forth God in your worldview? No, neither is mine. We know that he comes from the meta metaphysical. He is eternal, everlasting. There's nothing that caused he, God. Well, he, he is com- just he, an eternal so I, being. I don't think, you know, he comes from the metaphysical. That doesn't make any sense. No, 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 no. He is, he is the metaphysical. He is the metaphysical because we know that he embodies eternity. So 
he is the metaphysical is a nonsensical re it's a reaffirmation well, of what the well, statement well, says. Well, God occupies all of eternity, correct? We believe he is omniscient in all places at all time, correct? Right. Or so, uh, uh, omnipresent, sorry. So is this the same God of the Muslims? No. Okay, so it's not in it's not a general revelation natural theology God. Okay. And it's not Aristotle. If we exist, we we, we, so are, the, we are, it, you, you are the, sounding, you're sounding kind I'm not trying to is be it the mean, Christian you're God? sounding kind of like an atheist right now. We know God exists just from creation, right? There is a general revelation no, and there's a I, I don't accept revelation. this premise at all. Uh, oh, I don't believe so, in, so, 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 I don't believe so when in you, natural theology like many reform people. So, so really, okay. So really quick, uh, the reprobate, the non-believer, right? You believe him when he says, no, there is no God. And I know there's no God. You believe him when no, he says that. This is all non sequiturs because- all No, 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 no. Uh, it's direct. Does the non-believer non really think that- the, Does the non-believer non really think that there is no God? It doesn't Can follow he, from my Do you my think question. he's lying or- like, It doesn't follow from my questioning that I think there's no God because I'm asking a question that an atheist asks. This is a basic philosophical question. Okay. If I ask uh, the question, I don't know how to get past asked, it. Then. It doesn't I, I, mean that I'm an atheist. All well, I'm asking is that on your position, when you are appealing to general revelation, first, what you said is an unmoved mover. I mean, that's not our God. The Christian. Well, God there's is no cause. There's no causation to God. That's what that means. Okay, but unmoved mover is the way Aristotle describes God, and that's not the Christian God. So I'm asking you how you okay, know. Okay, uh, my bad on the unmoved mover. Abandon unmoved mover from your mind. There is no cause to our God, Wait correct? So, <laughs> so don't use the argument you just used. <laughs> well, we're, we're, well we're, we're, we're reaching a, a, a roadblock in the whole argumentation. I'm just allowing the premise saying this makes no sense. Uh, so this, but we we don't know and i'm saying okay question. cool uh, allow the premise then yes uh that that's a bad way to phrase it this is still an eternal god who created us right okay is it a personal god yes is there a generic concept of person that's not father son and spirit no so you're arguing for the trinity yes Okay, so isn't the that trinity the trinity the, the trinity just like the isn't the, that the being the being isn't and that the persons of god of are all eternal they were not created isn't the doctrine of trinity a doctrine of revelation yes okay so it's not general revelation well general revelation just knows that you know that a god exists Okay, and I asked you, is that God? As a result, Father, just from looking out in the I world. I said, is he personal? And you said, yes. Yes. And then you said, is it Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So now it's not general revelation anymore. All right. I, I would say move forward. Move forward. Okay. Next question is... Uh, Volpe's five dollars. Pedro, I'm not sure how much you know of the Old Testament. There's a lot that we do i think he means as orthodox that is in the old testament for example there is the petitioning of the mother of the king in uh, the old testament there's venerating and healing that occurs by objects such as the bones of elisha and there is liturgical worship in the old testament so i would agree with that gotcha. read arthur kessler two dollars pedro how do you know that the scripture lens that you use when you talked earlier about that lens isn't tainted by your own man-made tradition or fallible because of your human fallen nature. Because God is able to, in his sovereign, meaning ultimate authority, absolute power, okay. total control, use a crooked stick to make a straight line. Do you and understand? Provide and commit right. to people his actual word. Do you understand? Which means we can right. get scripture Do you understand with fallible why? people. So, if I say to you that I think that's begging the question, do you understand why I say that? I'm not asking if you agree with I, me, I, but do you yeah, understand I don't, why I don't I know. Say I, I would go with, I don't know. Let's see where, let's see where it goes. I don't know. So take okay. us through that line. Explain, explain it. Well, what I was trying to get at in the last uh, series of questions was precisely that there's a, there's a flipping back and forth that occurs between the appeals to what you're calling general revelation, which when I dig into it, seems to then turn back into what's in scripture. So the question was originally about the content of scripture. 
And right. you were like, well, I'm not really going to that. I'm just going to look over here at the general revelation. But the meaning of general revelation actually turns out to be what's in scripture, the Trinity. Yeah. So, and, and I, I think my problem here is the starting point for everyone. The starting point is the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But you're that, 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 that is the starting. You point. are equating that with the written text. And that's the presupposition that was never demonstrated equating it so the whole well well just see where the i, I just need to see where the uh, fallacy is coming in the it's holy spirit the, the the outpouring of the holy spirit is what is responsible for communicating the written word of god to his elect people yeah but that's a non where in that statement it's a non sequitur because yeah, nobody disagrees that the holy spirit inspired the text of scripture at least between. all right can the holy spirit error of course not Perfect. So relying on the plans and purposes of God in yeah. in the but Holy your Spirit. Your presupposition is that I, it, that's where I source all of my I yes, scripture is your, true. But your presupposition is that that excludes the church after the first century. Well, no, no, no. no. I'm not excluding. I'm not excluding the church, right? I'm saying the church but, but was a are. tool. That's but, but I'm saying the what church. You're doing. I, I, I'm saying the church should not boast. Right and say it How was us that, who did the, it. It was us who did irrelevant. it. I'm saying it's the I'm saying it's boasting, the Holy Spirit who. It's used irrelevant it. to the argument in, at hand. It has nothing to do with boasting or not. That's the core of the argument, though. Where does That's scripture not come an from? Argument. That how does that affect the epistemic question at hand? The ep, the epistemic the objective is God. We both believe that, and no that, one can stop an His answer. hand. You're not, I, I, don't think, I, I, I don't think, think we're disconnecting. You're I, I not think understanding we're just that the objection and the question. It's not a question of God's sovereignty. It's a question of the historic means by which the canon comes to be. Right. And I put the sovereignty above the historic means. So, so when I ask you how you know about the sovereignty of God, you said yes. from general revelation. And when I asked you about that, it actually turned out to be special well, he, revelation. He, he, well, I, I acknowledge and that special he revelation. The church, Special revelation begs the question because it assumes that you have the canon right. I acknowledge that the Holy Spirit used the church in order to communicate God's revealed will to us. But you right? don't you don't believe that because you you reject. Why, why can I not believe that? Because God, you reject God's the, sovereign hand can because use anybody. you reject the canon that the church has. So you sir, don't actually sir, think, that. Sir, sir, think about it this way. We have Genesis 50, do you believe Isaiah in the, 10, do you believe and in Acts the 4. You don't, believe in have, the can, I, you don't believe in the canon of Scripture that we have. You accept no, Luther's canon of Scripture, not ours. No, so you don't actually believe that. Sir, just think about it this way. Try, try, and, try and get on this line of thought. Genesis 50, Isaiah 10, Acts 4. All examples of God you just keep using a people... Secure, you keep you, the I, I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying. It's all examples of using people in order to implement His will on earth yeah, without so hiccup. You should accept. I gave the example of Athanasius. You should accept that as an example of God's providence using the church. It's you that has a problem with God's providence using the church. Well, well was Athanasius always in you know good standing with the church during his time? No, but that's precisely the point: is that he was correct and everyone else was wrong. What was his grounding to make him correct and everybody else wrong? If you read him, he says scripture and tradition. The very thing that you don't agree with. Okay, so Athanasius, he has tradition. Wait, 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 one second. He has in his festal letters, and, well, in right, his right, festal right. letters, which you should read, he says the Holy Ghost inspired the fathers of Nicaea in their declaration. And so anyone who disagrees with Nicaea is going against the Theonustos canon. So you specifically do not believe. Well, let's identify this really quick. The church that he's battling at the time has their traditions, and Athanasius has his tradition. No, right? that's, that's totally not true. Well, well what, where are they arguing There's not from? A separate, Athanasius said, "I'm not arguing a separate from scripture." Church that he battled. He well, battled. Well, I'm just, I, he battled I he, heretics who were within the church who ended up I, outside the church. But I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And they are outside the church, but they have traditions, right? That's begging. The, the question is whether the traditions are true or false. It's not a question of tradition. Perfect. How do we true? How do we how do we identify whether a tradition is true or false? Is it scripture? No, it's not just scripture. It is scripture and tradition, the tradition of the church. 
the Theo okay, Nusbaum. Well, well, we all have our Do traditions. you understand? I that my... I'm just repeating what Athanasius says in his festal letter. So it's basically you are disagreeing not with me, but with Athanasius. Because okay. Athanasius writes festal letters where he says the Holy Ghost spoke through Nicaea, and anybody who disagrees with Nicaea is disagreeing with the Holy Ghost. Well, what if me and you said we have the Holy Ghost, we both have our traditions, right? I have the traditions of Calvinism. I can identify that. And you have the tradition of the Orthodox Church. What's the final point of contact we should go to in order to see whose traditions and who's actually in communion with the Holy Spirit? Well, it's going to be who has the actual true church, right? Because that's the church the has tradi- point. Okay. That's the pillar okay. and gra- that's the pillar and ground of truth, not the written but, text. But brother, look here. We What's, have oh, we have a prime example right now. Pope Francis. Brother, we have a prime example right now. Pope Francis. Pope Francis. That Papal is irrelevant to the debate between Their us. Their tradition led to that, correct? Of course not. So tradition did lead to papal infallibility and it Again, was in fact scripture? Do you know what equivocation is? You're equivocating on tradition. You're assuming that because you're saying that because Pope Francis arises from a false tradition, tradition is the problem. That's an equivocation. I'm not saying all tradition is the problem. I'm saying they then, failed then, to identify. Then the papacy I'm, argument is irrelevant. Well, well, I'm trying to show you where the papacy obviously uh, the papacy obviously is relevant. I would agree, but also could have been destroyed then why, if they then, properly then it, then use the irrelevant. scriptures okay. as a lens to identify. No, papal infallibility is not a thing. We reject that. Yeah. We need so, a multiplicity of elders. No. Again, the history. If you read the apologetic tradition on this issue, right, the opposition to the papacy precisely comes from the violation of the canonical tradition first and foremost. So the Byzantine lists of the Middle Ages appeal to the tradition of the church in the canons as to why the papacy cannot be true, as well as textual debates and argumentation. But the point is that it's not just a question of who has more texts, me versus them, Pope versus Orthodox. It's a question beyond the text. It's also part of the history of the church because the church is a historical entity. The church is not a thing that's propositionally just in your head. It's a thing from history. This is this is the issue at, at, at root here. Let's move on because we, we can be here all night and we can do a part two down the road or something like that. But we, we got to sure, yeah. yeah. move on. To and hey, I want to thank you once again. You're a beast. You did two streams tonight, right? Beast. Nice. I appreciate this. Looking Golden on. Arm 2007, 50 bucks. I don't understand the infallible list in God's mind, but is fallible in man's possession. This makes no sense. Um, I would just say go back to my old opening statement and uh, review that. You'll 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 see it's it's right there. Like uh, I mean, God knows what He's going to do. It says even yeah, in but, Scripture, we don't know the His ways are above our ways. We don't perfectly know what God can yeah, do. What's happening is God is God is in His own um yeah. in His own on His own prerogatives at, uh, of His own will at His own time. He is giving us what is correct. I don't believe that, you know, the Bible so, fell again, down completely exhaustively from heaven. That's begging the question. Because okay. you're saying that God's will is known from general revelation, I mean scripture, and that's how we know. No, no, no. I don't I didn't say God's will is known from a general revelation. I you said God say in God's existence is known you in said general his revelation. Nature, his purpose for me is known. And I asked you the content, where did you get that knowledge from? And you said general revelation. Where do you get yeah, I think I think I I think I might just be mixed here, but I would just say this firmly, sir. General revelation shows that a God does exist, right? Salvific revelation comes from the reveal of, from the real will of God. Actually, lets you know who that God is. Okay, stating That's what natural much theology it. is is not a response to the question that I asked. We'll move okay. on. Orthodox yeah. con- Orthodox convert two dollars. Pedro, have you ever visited an Orthodox church? I'm a recent convert, and I thank God for the church. Study of history and constant prayer were the reason for my conversion. Keep reading the church fathers and seeking Christ. Thank you to you both. I appreciate that, sir. And I would actually like to go to an Orthodox church just to obviously get a fair understanding because. Uh, what I will say is I do not uh, like some people online who just outright, you know, slander uh, the Orthodox Church specifically without even going in properly and doing the the hard work. That's why in my whole argumentation here, I never actually brought up anything of the Orthodox Church because I don't know you guys yet. I, I hope in our future conversations, I get to know you guys better so I can 
get a better uh, grasping of what you believe. Fair enough. Uh, Chad King, $1. Thank you both. Pedro, I agree with your argumentation, except the general, uh, uh, the general Protestant sola scripture. What then? How would I possibly choose which denomination is correct? Would my salvation be at stake based on my interpretation? Uh, I think, um, this go, it, it kind of sounds like if I, you don't believe what I believe, then you're, uh, totally damned. And I think that is a very naive position to take. Obviously there, you know, during, along the process of sanctification, there's different levels of maturity in people's uh, knowledge. Obviously I'm green here. This is one of my first big, uh, I think debates in theology. So I'm not saying that I actually demonstrated perfectly here or would even have the authority to make a judgment call over someone's salvation, uh, yeah. So I, I just wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't do that. Macedonian rank one, $1 Macedonia and Christ are eternal. <laughs> Golden arm, 2007, $3. Please explain, uh, begging the question, non sequitur and equivocation. These might be helpful. Well, just, yeah. I mean, in, 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 in quick begging the question would be, uh, what I interpret him as saying that I think is begging the question is when I ask for, the principle by which he knows what is correct in terms of God's will or the canon, it was appeals to the thing that's in question, right? That he has the right canon and he has uh, the interpretation correctly of those texts. And I'm asking for the epistemic principle that tells him which book is correct and which list is correct. And he just went to the text as if that tells him which book or list is correct. So that for me is begging the question. Non sequitur is when it doesn't follow right so the premises or the 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 propositions that are stated they don't uh the the conclusion doesn't follow from those premises um equivocation is the idea that the word or uh, uh, a phrase has the same meaning in every context or setting like the word concept fallacy um so for example uh he was equivocating on tradition so he was saying that something like uh you know the, the pope comes from a false tradition and so tradition is a problem and therefore no, 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 we, no. therefore we should follow scripture no 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 i i'm saying uh tradition is not infallible as compared to theopneustos god breathed revelation the word of god there are traditions that are good like for example here's a good here's a good example it is not a bad tradition for uh if you were to tell your people hey in giving the blessing for who will take your daughter as their bride you need to sit this man down and actually see if he's knowledgeable in the word of god how would that be a bad but tradition you admitted that sola scriptura is a tradition right it's and you, it's and, 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 and I, you admitted that the contents of sola scriptura could be wrong well, the basis upon which it's standing is not wrong, which is scripture. So I, I would say this. I think you're the, saying that. That is begging sola, the question. No, Do you understand so, this? So, yeah. This is a remember my, argument. remember my pre, so but remember my pre. It's a fallacy. I'm just going to, uh, uh, that's a fallacy. But, but think, but, well, let, let's think about it this way, sir. What if it could be standing in your mind where it's saying, like I had on the slide in the beginning of my opening statement, uh, scripture uh, or sola scriptura is the sole infallible rule of faith. What might be standing in your mind is uh, sola scriptura is the sole rule of faith. Could that possibly be happening at all? Could what be happening? You say we don't uh, value any 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 tradition, right? Yeah. I'm saying that we, we just examine our saying. tradition. That's not true. It's a specific okay. question about how you know the contents of scripture. And you just keep equivocating. The sovereignty of God. I ask you how you know about that, where you get that knowledge, and you said general revelation, and then you said special revelation. A God exists, right? How do you and know he, that that, begging the question, how do you know that that God is the Christian God? How do you Scripture. know that God is it? How do you know that God is the Christian God? <clears throat> Give me a moment. I mean, you have to go to Scripture. Exactly, you have to go to scripture. Okay, so that's begging the question. The, the question Where is does about the contents from? of scripture. Where does scripture come from? All right, I'm, we're going to move on. God. Roll state. It, that's yeah. not answering the question. Nobody. How is that? Nobody not an disagrees that God but, is the but, ultimate source of tradition. The question you is said, about. You admit the question is about how do we determine the canon of scripture? And you can't right. just say because God, bro. 
That's well, not well, I'm not saying. I, well, I'm not saying because God, bro. I'm saying God, like we agreed upon, is a personable God, a okay. personal one. And right? He interacts in his, cre- in, in his creation, you, and he wants his nope. creation to know him. Right? Nope. I asked you how you know that, and that he's personal. I said, "Is there yeah. any?" I said, "Is there any?" Is God personal apart from Father, Son, and Spirit? And you said no. And Father, Son, and Spirit is a doctrine of Scripture in Revelation. Right, right. And think about it this way. That is a the, circle. The, That's a right, circle. Oh, oh, okay, so think about it this way. The Trinity, God, Father, uh, uh, Son, uh, Holy Spirit, and God, and, and, and the Father. I'm getting mixed up, sorry. They're, they're in a personal relationship. We're made in their image, Right. Just like them, we I'm are asking, personal. We are we we, we, we commune with one another. Believe. I'm not asking you what you believe or what the Trinity doctrine is. I'm asking you the epistemic principle by which you know those things. I I, I would say epistemic is referring to the objective, correct? It just like means, it exists it outside means, of our mind. It just means knowledge. What yeah, is the but prin- but epistemic means the- it exists outside of our mind. Without us here, two plus two is still equals four. That's not correct? what the word means. No, it's not. It's not a. So, all right. What's epistemic on. mean? It just has to do with with knowledge. That our our doctrine of knowledge, how we know what we know, what do we know? Can we justify our beliefs? It's a domain of philosophy, epistemology. So I'm and asking, the answer rests in the objective. I'm saying I'm asking it for the, in the principle. Objective. So when you make these statements, they're based on a source. What is the source for these beliefs that you have when you say things like God is personal? God wants, uh, you know, is sovereign. He's provident. He wants this for my life. He wants me to know this. He has this meaning for me, this purpose for me. I'm just asking you how you know what that stuff is. What's the source of the content of those propositions? Let's, let, let's try and construct it with some premises. Premise one, right? Dude, they're, they're, I'm not they're, trying to be mean. You're, you're not. No, I'm not getting it. Maybe I, I think we're running past each other because you keep saying, um, you know, begging. I'm, the I'm question. asking basic philosophical questions. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be a dick. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just asking about how you know, where's the, what's the source for those beliefs? And you said general revelation. Yes. But, the, but then, but then when I ask you, there is a God. But when there I is ask a God. you, you're not getting it, dude. When I ask you the questions of what that means, it falls back on things that are not general revelation that are scripture. So it's begging the question. How many times do I have to state that for you? Do you understand? Okay. Uh, I, I think I would have to just review the tape and, and, and write it down and try and come That's up okay. with an answer for you. Yeah. It, it, we'll move on. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. cover it in the future. Roll stakes, $5. Can you recommend Pedro some chalk.com products so that he might partake in the beast energy? 500 streams in one day for talking for 15 hours straight nonstop. That's exactly right. 500 hours. And yes, we have a show sponsor, which is chalk.com. Be sure to go to uh, what's in the um, uh, chat there. You do get uh, 60% off if you use the promo code J60. That is the show uh, and channel um, sponsor. And we love those guys. And yes, I am presently powered by chalk energy, beast energy. Braden Rice, $1. <clears throat> Unitarians use Sola Scriptura arguments from the canon of Scripture uh, that you have, uh, Pedro, that also they think denies Christ's divinity. How could you argue against the interpretation of Scripture without appealing to a tradition such as the Nicene Creed? Gotcha. So just sticking in uh, the, the Bible itself, I would go to Psalms 102 where it describes, you know, God being unchanging and think, things, of the, things of this nature. It gives a uh, verbatim, you know, text. And then I would kind of try and make the Unitarian close the back door on saying, is this true? Like, uh, I would say Jehovah's Witnesses. Is it, can this uh, be true of anybody but Jehovah God? If they close that door and say, yes, that is Jehovah God, I would then uh, go into... I think it's John, is it John? No, it's not John 3.16. It's somewhere in John where it gives an exact uh, reference to the sun, right? Using the, it's actually quoting from Psalms 102, who the sun is, right? So from there, I would then ask him, okay, you just said before that this can be true of anyone but Jehovah God. And this is Jesus being identified right here verbatim as jehovah god is jesus god that's how i would do it like that 
Nicodemus 3.33. Pedro, Jay is asking you how you know that soul scripture is true, and you're saying that soul scripture is true because soul scripture says it is the case that is so. Uh, this is like saying my diary is infallible because my diary says my diary is infallible. Well, I, I, I would say I would say this. I'm saying that sola scriptura is true because it's stating that by the divine sovereign decree of God, he would from eternity past, he decreed he sovereignly decreed this, that he would give a revealed will to his people. And nothing, no organization on man could ever have stopped that from happening. But again, that's known from scripture. I, I don't want to run in a circle again. I would just say next question. Right. And but, yeah, um, that's the last of the super chats. So thank you, Pedro. Okay. It was a, a nice debate and hopefully we can, uh, you know, uh, set up some good uh, topics and debates in the future if you want to. For, for sure. Yeah. I was actually interested on the uh, Trinity. So do you, and this is just a passing question. You don't have to answer it in full. Now we can argue it later. Do you think I don't believe exactly what the Orthodox believe about the Trinity? No, of course not. Oh, perfect. Cool. No, no, so no, we no, do, no, no. We I'm do saying, agree on the Trinity. Okay. No, cool. no, 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 no. You misunderstand me. I'm saying you, of course, do not accept what we believe. We are totally at odds. Okay. One being of God, three distinct persons, all fully partaking in that being of God, right? Is that is there any error in that statement? No, but uh, I mean, that's not really, I mean, that's like a good starting point, you could say, but the, for example, I mean, every Reformation church that I've ever heard of or know about believes in the filioque, and that's a fundamental thing that the Orthodox Church rejects. I'm going to be honest, I've never heard of the filioque, but if we believe that there is one eternal being of God, three distinct persons, all equally and fully participating in and in communion with that being i think we're solid so i i i i think we're just be mincing words after that so that's right like that's like saying um me and a mormon believe in uh the phrase jesus is god so we're we're straight we're all good well when the mormon oh, that's the <laughs> no i on. mean so we were when, very specific in being when the mormon ex persons. when the mormon explains what he means Okay. We totally disagree over the meaning of Jesus as God, right? So in the same way, even though the phrase one essence, three persons is something that we have in common, okay. the filioque is a uh, fundamental issue that all Reformation and Western churches accept that the Orthodox Church holds as fundamentally heterodox. So no, okay. we don't. Oh, how about this? Christology, hypostatic union. Jesus so again, is 100% man and 100% have... God. Again, it's more than that. So you don't is believe, he a, but you don't is believe he you don't believe Ephesus, you don't believe Chalcedon, you don't believe the fifth or sixth councils. So no, can we don't you, agree. Can you without the long words, can you just explain it like to me? I'm like I'm a layman. So what we should probably do is a separate discussion for that. Yeah, because that my would bad. be a whole other topic. But I'd be glad to, you know, you can come back and we can talk Christology anytime. Perfect. Okay, cool. Nice. All right. Anything you want to leave anybody with? Uh, of course, I've got your channel linked, The Crucible. Anything else you want to leave us with? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you again to Jay Dyer for having me on his channel. Obviously, I'm I'm, I'm super green. I've, ne I've never actually had, I think, a legit theological debate like this. This is my first time. So for him to be able to say, uh, yes, I will let this peasant come onto my channel. <laughs> no, I don't feel like that. I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, kidding, I'm, 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 kidding. I'm glad yeah. you're here and uh, it was a good discussion and we, we often I mean it was civil it was heated it was good it was perfect um, mm -hmm. and no I don't I don't look down on you or anything like that I mean our, our goal as we, we we're very open about it we want people to be orthodox because we think it's true so that's our goal here um, and you're welcome anytime and uh, thank you for having me on the crucible and everybody have a good night perfect all right later dude